Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Bracket Show. Happy Easter. Uh, what? It's Easter, I know. Oh. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Taylor, hi, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> um, it's a word we, for it. <laughs> we spent the day watching movies, doing some last minute catch up yep. that we wanted to do for the show. Um, so that was good. Yeah, that's yeah. all I got. Made, made some of these matchups a little harder for you. Uh, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm not ready. Anyway, it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one. Mara, how are you? Apparently it's Easter. <laughs> That's Fair. the zombie Jesus holiday, right? I uh, think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. As someone who's cool. actually not religious at all. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, happy Easter to the people that Easter. Fair. Uh, Adam, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I celebrated uh, the holiday um, uh, by watching some uh, Blunden mandated films. Uh, so. <laughs> But I am happy to say that I uh, I was able to round uh, round the course this week. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it every week, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 pretty uh, fired up about a few things today, and <laughs> I, I, I I'm really worried about the things you're gonna put up against. Each other. I I agree, and um, I just want to respond to this comment here. I I don't I'm not ready. Okay, <laughs> I think it's gonna be one of those nights. Well, so. the person who shouldn't be ready at all is our last guest, Marisol. <laughs> how are you? I've been better. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I was already entering this night with a little bit of trepidation because I knew the list on there and I knew I knew some of my favorites were going to gonna fall this week. And on top of it, I'm actually sick. <laughs> so you're going to get doped up NyQuil extra spicy. Don't give a flipping frogger tonight, me. So nice. well, well, I am backed okay. into a corner and I have nothing left. <laughs> in a literal corner. Uh, but she insisted that we set up in this corner, so it's not. Ah. So he literally just told you you were asking for it, Marisol. What do you have to say? <laughs> I I got nothing. I will. I'm disappointed will, in you, Adam. Right. I'm, not gonna, Adam. I'm not going to hurt you vicariously. You and I will both yeah. be sleeping on the couch tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we only have a love seat in this little living room. So I, have to, I mean, just know. ask me. I, I don't know. It's been a while since I've seen the updates on streamer. Is there a virtual bitch slap option? <laughs> <laughs> we yes. need to create one. Just, just give Taylor a dollar and I think she'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, just give me that one look. <laughs> <laughs> All right. are, we, are we just gonna rip the band-aid off all right so yeah i think we should <laughs> okay. guys um this is week one this is week one we are officially starting the bracket today all 256 films we have 32 of them today Ugh. and we will be cutting that list down to 16 <sighs> 16 of our favorite films and some of the best movies from the 2010s will be gone. I do just want to reiterate before we start. Okay. We do love all of the, most of these movies. Like this <laughs> is coming from a place of love. This all is of coming these, from most of place, these. Yeah. This is coming from a place of, Hey, let's just talk about movies that are great. Um, now that that's out of the way, please don't kill me. Um, let's start. Is this one of those like you're gonna suffer, but you're gonna be happy about it? Yeah, like things. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Here we go. The difficulty spike has gone up. I believe begins with Parasite versus Coco. <laughs> so uh, Adam with the the one with a child. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll let you start. <laughs> okay. Well, to be fair, I've only watched Coco with her once, um, and she liked it fine. Uh, she, we'll probably watch it again someday. I like Coco. Uh, solid picture. Um, uh, no, I um, honestly, when that movie came out, the thing I appreciate about it is like it was it was at a time where like Pixar, you know, it's not that they're like 
completely humdrum, but we've got a little used to some of the output there. And Coco, like, separate from the pack, uh, you know. I mean, it was in close proximity to Inside Out, so that was a heavy hitter as well. But my point is I just like that it was uh, a more thoughtful Pixar film uh, with a lot of good music as well. Um, that said, uh, Parasite, you know, is special not only because of everything it accomplished, but what I really like about it is its universality uh, in terms of, you know, it's, it's you know, a very Korean movie in every sense of the word. But uh, what I like about it is the way it fixes you in uh, both families' perspectives and the way it ratchets up as a horror fan, the tension and some of the creepy imagery. Um, but it never feels cheap. It never feels forced. Um, and a lot of the tension comes from a lot of the, you know, just having to hide out and, and things like that. I don't want to, I want to give everyone a chance to talk about Parasite. The short version is I am going to vote for it over Coco, even though I think Coco is a very strong entry um, out of 2010's Pixar. It's one of the better movies, but um, Parasite deservedly won best picture and best foreign film. And um, I'm never going to forget the guy on the stairs. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, that, that, that image is, for whatever reason, dear to my heart. So, um, yeah, Parasite. Marisol. Yeah, I mean, you're easing me in with this one. I think this one is straightforward for me. Um, do, do, really, do really enjoy Coco. I really do like this movie. Um, I, I liked it at first and then liked it even more on a rewatch. And it is, like you said, one of the most thoughtful and intimate and maybe more human human reaching um, films that Pixar has ever done. Pixar does, brings a lot of fantasy and kind of broad sentimentality to some of their movies, which we all love. But I think the specificity and the intimacy of, of the family connections in Coco does make it really special. And the colors are some of the most, has one of the most gorgeous palettes, color palettes in I think all of Pixar. Mm -hmm. I think it is just breathtaking. And Remember me, I sing that song so much. I sing the Spanish version. Like I, I love, I love, I mean, both versions are great, but my favorite is is, is the one that, that goes in and out of Spanish. Um, that being said, Parasite is, I do think that Parasite is an all timer. And I think that this film is gonna be talked about as one of the great social satires of, of this century. I think it's deft blend of, like you said, the thriller, the slight tinge of horror, and the pitch black comedy is is masterful. I think it is a fine, fine line to thread. And it's, it's it satisfies a thirst for something, a, a big like bucket list thing that we've always wanted to see is that temptation, that conflict directly between the classes. Like, you know, we always have stories told from, I don't know how to say what I'm gonna say, it, it's okay. My my choice is Parasite, but seeing 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 both ends of of the classism thrown into the mix like that and having it get really really just sick and diabolical and manipulative and fucked up, this is an all timer, and that outweighs Coco. Uh, Mar uh, I agree with what everyone has said thus far. Um, I think a good analogy is that Parasite is the korean get out like it is so much more than just its genre like it's commentary on class and stuff that's it is in your face but it's so subtle in its application as in like the themes are there it's incredibly obvious what it's trying to communicate to you but you are so enthralled with the characters and the story and it is so hard i i mean adam i'm sure is exactly the same way we have seen so many horror movies but I was completely surprised at the end of that film. I was mm -hmm. I was sitting there just like my head was exploding. I'm like, what the fuck is happening here? <laughs> and it was it was a wild ride. It is one of the most worthy best picture winners in the last decade. And uh, I don't mm -hmm. think it's talked about as much as it should be. Like I know people talk about it as if it's a great movie. But like the way people talk about Get Out being like, oh, it's a horror movie that really has something to say. I think people sometimes forget about the fact that Parasite really had a lot to say. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love Coco. I really do. But that's just 
another film in a great canon of films that is like emotional and celebrates a culture and, you know, is gorgeous to behold. And that doesn't diminish its quality, but Parasite is so singularly fantastic and unique. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Parasite's a really um, personal movie for you and I almost in a way, just mm. because it came out a little bit like we saw it late. We saw so it after the hype late. of everyone seeing it and like freaking out about how awesome it was. And we went in not knowing what it was. We just knew that it was so like everyone was in love with it and it was so exciting. And I think it's a great movie, but it did that thing we talked about last week where it was the hype was so up here that even though it was amazing, I was just like, it almost was a letdown just because people had hyped it up so much. Like I hate, I hate going into movies like that, even mm. if it ends up being great. It's just something like there was kind of a weird disconnect for you and I with it for a while. I think I appreciate it more the further I get away from that situation where I can just like appreciate it for what it is rather than being in the whole whirlwind moment of it. I remember being so excited, even though it wasn't my favorite movie of that year. I was so excited when Bong won. I was so excited when it got Pest Picture just because it was like that moment mm. that I just didn't think was going to happen, but I loved that we got a movie like that, getting that kind of recognition on a stage where a lot of people still feel that it doesn't really happen as often as it should. So that was awesome. Um, and I think just, just for all of that, like great movie has so much to say is so relevant is executed so beautifully and and just because of that, like I would have to vote for it, even though it's not my personal favorite. Um, I just really appreciate it for what it is. Um, I I'm gonna go, uh, and even if this was a deciding vote, I'd still go with it. Um, I'm gonna go with Coco. Uh, Coco, I think is a top five Pixar film. I I, I really really adore P Coco a lot, and um, so and, and like and again, yeah. Parasite, I think, is an excellent film. It has grown on me a lot more than the first time we saw it. But Coco was just one that hit, hit really hard when it first came out. Hit, and I've just, I really do love Coco a lot. So I'm, I'm I am going to go with Coco. Doesn't matter though. Uh, Parasite does move on to the next round, and we do say goodbye to our first film with. Coco. We'll remember uh, you though, Coco. We will. <laughs> yeah, we will. All right. And the hits keep coming. Call me by your name versus drive. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> okay. okay I'm feeling better. All right, y'all. All right. <laughs> okay. Marisol, I'm gonna let you start. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Y'all, drive though, drive, <laughs> <laughs> drive. <laughs> Look, God damn it, Jacob. <laughs> um, <laughs> drive is, drive is a box cutter to the throat theatrical experience. It is, it is, it is, <sighs> Man, it is it is a highlighter cocaine blasted out of a shotgun sensory expressionist minimalist cinema. Okay. We need to protect Drive. This is one of the most explosive films of the 2010s, you guys. This is this is the moment. This is the masterpiece by far. I mean, I'm not gonna say by far, but absolutely my favorite thing. Nicholas winding around. Ren. 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 Nicholas rewind is what I call Nick him. Yeah. Rewind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I rewind this bitch so much. And, uh, and this is iconic. This movie is iconic. The snake skin jacket, Gosling, the hammer, Oscar Isaac, the car. I just, the nighttime LA, the lights, the cinematography, the sexiness, the soundtrack, 
that that chromatics tick tock that tick tock of the clock soundtrack mm -hmm. the mood this is style cinema to the nth degree and it's not style in no some sense it's style and versus i'm just gonna keep saying minimalism because you sometimes when you strip a film down to its most its boldest and most feral and evocative qualities you get lightning in a bottle at drive is and drive is a special movie few have been made like it before few i don't, I don't i'm trying to think of one that's been like it since i'm going on about drive I do want to give a shout out to Call Me By Your Name, though. <laughs> I know that, um, I don't know. Have we, I can't, I can't keep up with people. Have we canceled this movie because of Army Hammer? Does I thought, I thought like, like, I thought we had to reevaluate this movie because of him. Okay. Okay. So Call Me By Your Name get, gets out free. That being said, I still think, um, regardless of that, I'm not going to factor that in. I think this is a beautiful portrait about teenage longing. I think it is. I love watching this movie. It reminds me of almost like, it almost takes me back, Luco Guadarino, Guadarino. It feels like I'm watching like like French New Wave when I'm watching Call Me by Your Name. Specifically, the way he shoots it feels like it's from another time. The 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 photography in it is gorgeous, and and Timothy Chalamet. I could kind of take or leave Army Hammer because he's not the focus of the movie though. It had to come to grips with that. It all it is all about Timothy Chalamet's journey as this young inexperienced teenager, incredibly smart teenager who's trying to figure out the world and and yearning for that 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 connection. Timothy Chalamet is the heart and soul of this movie. He is crushing that last that last shot is soul crushing. And as wonderful as he is, I never quite feel as connected to this movie. It does leave me a little cold and a little distant even though I recognize the filmmaking is A and call me by your name, but sweetheart, it is not going to be drive here for me. <laughs> For all the reasons I said, I'm done. Sorry, yeah. I'm done. Adam, Adam, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm done too. I, um, also, there I, needs to be more sex and call me by your name. I'm sorry, I know they're just. I'm just gonna say it. I'm just gonna say it. They need it to be. There, there's, there's a lot. Of, I love the the visuals. I love the symbolism of of the the, the eroticism. Call me by your name. But I don't want to say sex. Well, I mean, it kind of was sex. You know, him and that that. Um, Peach, that little peach, yeah, a little peach every <laughs> chance, but keep going. Um, um, really, actually, um, I think Call Me by Your Name is excellent. Um, uh, I was surprised by this movie when it came out. Um, I thought it was uh, just uh, a really impressive um, uh, display of like human empathy, you know, from from Guadagnino, who's gone on to do some very interesting stuff since this, and I and I love how dynamic <laughs> he is as a filmmaker. Um, but what I like about Call Me By Your Name is, even though it goes back to a very specific time, uh, with um, a kid who, you know, is from a rich family, this is obviously fairly privileged, um, I never lose a sense of connection with the characters in it. Um, uh, and I really, uh, I relate to the, like, just the, the whole, I, I like summer fling movies. I really do. I, I think they're, it's like a fun, like, little subgenre of romance. And I think this is one of the great summer fling films, um, you know, mm -hmm. because it's 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 more of a coming of age story than a deep romance. And it's about Timothy Chalamet's character growing up uh, very fast. And um, one of my favorite uh, parts of the movie uh, uh, is, you know, the scene with his father played by M Michael Stuhlbarg, you know, later in the film. Very, very great scene, um, you know, uh, between him and his son. Stuhlbarg, by the way, just not for nothing. That guy's one of my favorite actors working today. I just think that guy's awesome in everything. And because he's in everything, people take him for granted. But yeah, he's awesome in this. Um, really like the music, uh, both like the soundtrack and the score. Um, and I love the way it's shot. Uh, so yeah, I think this movie deserves all the attention it got at the time. I think it's going to hold up incredibly well. Um, with Drive, that's another movie I didn't expect at the time. I remember like all the buzz going into it. And I remember being excited to see it the way I was when I saw John Wick for the first time. And they're very different movies, um, you know, uh, equally badass in different ways. But what I love about Drive, music, definitely. Um, All-time performance from Gosling. Albert Brooks, just yes. absolutely astounding performance. And I love that that was a one and done, like villainous turn from him. Like, you know, he was hit up multiple times after that, from what I understand, to play villains. And he's like, nope, I was, I, I got to keep it special. And it is very special. 
Um, it's a great ensemble movie. I like that it's not simply about a badass beating up and killing a hundred dudes at once. Like he's not invincible, and um, he's and not also even admirable. He's yeah, he's a monster. Sorry. And Sorry. honestly, I honestly think Drive is a better remake of Roadhouse than the recent remake of Roadhouse. <laughs> <it's a> very, <laughs> Drive <laughs> is very similar to Roadhouse. Like if you look at the basic structure, it it uh, just trust me. Um, people who know already know this, um, but like. I all, all the way down to the point where the, you know, um, he makes himself look like a monster, you know, killing someone in front of the woman uh, he has affection for. So um, it is a very, very close race between these two. I think they're two really, really great movies. But by a hair, I'm going to vote for Drive just because I re I've seen it more times. I, I would put it on more often than I would rewatch Call Me By Your Name, even though I've seen that a couple times. And I think it's excellent. Uh, Jacob, you suck. Um, congratulations on drive for at least for my vote and yours. We'll see how it does. So Taylor, you experienced this movie for the first time today. Drive? drive. No, I'd seen drive. Before. Oh, I thought you hadn't. I thought, you, sorry, I thought you hadn't for some reason. No, I, oh, okay. I'd seen drive before. Okay, well, ignore that part then. Um, where okay, so uh, I will defer to you though. Great, thanks for You're that welcome. intro. Sorry. That was great. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you, I thought you had never seen drive. I told I, you I'd seen it. Okay, anyway. Glad somebody listens to me when I talk. Um, <laughs> so, so this one is an interesting one for me because I, I do I love both of these movies. Kind of as everyone's already touched on for completely different reasons. Um, Call Me by Your Name is a movie that I think really gave audiences a look at the baseline of what Timothy Chalamet's potential could be because he is so um, emotionally present in this movie. He gets to show off the fact that he can speak French and Italian very well. Um, and that he just kind of grew up in that world, which I love. I love that they switch between Italian and French and English just kind of so fluidly. Like it doesn't feel like it's shoehorned in there. It's very much, this is the life they live. They're a multilingual house. Um, and that's just a really cool element, I think, because I feel like a lot of European families and countries are like that, whereas we're heathens here and we're like, we speak English. <laughs> yes. Damn it. We don't even speak that right, Taylor. No. We don't even speak that most of the time. We don't even speak um, that good. <laughs> but I love that. I think it helps. Um, I really think it brings um, the kind of romanticism, like the romantic vibe to the movie, because, you know, again, here we're very... A lot of us romanticize the fact that people grow up speaking several languages because the country is like are all right there. And it's this really beautiful thing. Um, it's gorgeous. Like they very obviously shot it on location and it's beautiful. Like the color palette and the color grading is amazing. Um, and it is just a really it's like a I don't know. I think the, the summer fling genre is the white, right way to classify it and i think that it's a really special movie um i think i don't know i i think i enjoyed it more the first time i watched it because we rewatched it recently and i still really enjoyed it but i think like in the moment watching it the first time i had more of a connection with it really love it though really appreciate it um drive so i had seen drive before but i hadn't seen it in like eight years or something like that uh, it's been a long time since i've seen drive um and i had the opposite effect where last time i just don't like maybe i wasn't in the right mindset to watch it or maybe i just wasn't i didn't get it um because i was like oh you know it's like it's a good movie uh but we rewatched it today and it slaps <laughs> so hard <laughs> uh, it is so good it is so 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 good um it's crazy because like None of these actors look old now, but they are babies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are babies yeah. in this film, yeah. which is... So Including wild. Albert Brooks. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, well, because we did a double feature. We did Inside Lewin Davis and then Drive. And the aging mm. of Oscar Isaac backwards <laughs> is really interesting to interesting to watch. But um, but yeah, it it's the music is amazing. The way it's shot is amazing. Again, the, the use of color, the use of lighting the costuming like has to be one of the most iconic movie jackets that's ever been made just straight up um it's it's brutal 
it's exciting like it's tense the they never take their gas off the pedal <laughs> with it um it, it, it's 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 so it's paced so well but it's so in your face but it never feels like it's rushed it just feels like it's so deliberately paced and it works great um it's yeah it's the cast is awesome like i just yeah yeah <laughs> heck yeah drive Mara. um i agree with basically everything everyone has said um and obviously based on you know math uh <laughs> i know that drive is going to um accelerate its way through this round hey. um, see she sees what i did um <laughs> But um, I'm going to give Call Me By Your Name. It's um, I don't want to call it a pity vote because there are so many merits to the movie. But for me, it's for Michael Stuhlbarg's um, monologue at the end uh, mm -hmm. alone, because it is just I agree with what Khan said. He should have been nominated for, for this movie. Uh, it, that alone is probably maybe some of the best acting of his career. Um, and it's some of the best of that year. So mm -hmm. I agree with all re previous remarks, but I'm going to give Call Me By Your Name its its vote so it is not completely shut out. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny. I think I'm the... I, I think I'm probably the weakest on both of these films out of everyone here. Um, I greatly appreciate both of them, but Drive, I've ne I, I really like Drive. I've never been in love with it the way everyone else is and i really and i watched call me by your name for the first time this year i really appreciated it i didn't fall in love with it the way everyone else always did um so i i'm kind of very much in that like both of these are incredibly good films i just don't have the level of love for either of them personally i do think drive is a better film for me like i would be giving my vote to drive so um if it mattered drive would have still gone through anyway but uh yeah i i i love timothy chalamet's performance uh, in call me by your name but i but drive i do really i really love the the style and but i i do kind of believe it is a little bit style over substance for this and i think that's also me with um reference films i am not a nicholas whining reference fan i have most of his movies i'm just not that big on so um this one the fact like I, that i enjoy it is impressive it <laughs> kind of shows you that yeah no this is a this is there is an element to this one because as someone who's not a fan of his movies i still enjoyed it so yeah with that call we say goodbye to call me by your name unfortunately and drive does make it through all right now the so uh um, all of you guys have really tough ones this is my turn to have the really tough one uh about time versus it um i love about time about time is a fantastic film it is a movie that is a really somber and beautiful take on both love and relationships and um family and a father son relationship and uh, i that was that's an element of this movie that i really connected to a lot and i really do have an emotional attachment to that part of this movie uh but it's not it chapter one and it chapter one is one of my all-time favorite horror films i i love it chapter one it is one of the best movie going experiences i have ever had in my entire life chapter two we don't talk about <laughs> chapter one I think is is one of the best horror movies I have ever seen. I love it so much. Um, I it's just and everything about it I think is just so terrifying. It's so it's creepy. It's weird. It is able to uh, really get into the psyche of the. I, I think it's like. It, it, we, look, chapter two we don't talk about in this whole bracket. Um, but what oh, I like in this house. He's like, in this house. Um, you never know what happened to those kids. <laughs> yeah, but like what I really like about chapter one is just the is that 
childhood adventure to it. And I, I really like that that's what they focus on so much. Um, I love the performance from Bill Skarsgård as Pennywise. I think it is fantastic and terrifying. So I, I am going to give my vote to It Chapter 1. Uh, Mara, I'm going to go to you next. I... I have to agree. I mean, I was super skeptical. I'm not saying that the uh, Tim Curry one is like definitive per se, but that's the one I grew up with. And so mm -hmm. I was like, I don't really know how I feel about this, like, you know, Victorian era interpretation and he does a jig and that's <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> like that's that, that trailer's cool, I guess. That movie, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but oh my gosh. I mean, I I should revisit it more actually because I I don't as much as I as I feel like it deserves to be. But man, talk about I, I wouldn't say that I went in with low expectations because I really tried to give every movie a fair shake, but blew me away with uh the the quality. I think that it was very well cast. Um, I think that it actually made really good changes and improved on uh what came before it in a lot of different ways we don't talk about chapter two and <laughs> and i i don't actually have like a sentimental attachment to about time personally so yeah that's an easy one for me it tell um this is an interesting one because i haven't seen about time yet i have come close to watching it and then i'm like i don't know if i'm emotionally ready and then i don't watch it um it, I have a complicated relationship with. <laughs> um, it's a reason I haven't watched it as is, much. <laughs> horror is not my brand, generally speaking. Um, just because I do genuinely get afraid, but not in like a fun way. Um, in like a Jacob has to deal with panic attacks way. <laughs> so I don't watch horror a lot. I have seen it. Thank you so much for that, by the way. Oh, we did. We did. Right. we did. Um, and then right. and then I worked a uh, freaking fright nights <laughs> where we did the it maze, and then as a freaking cast, we had to all go through it, and I thought I was gonna throw up. Um, uh -oh. anyway, seeing the Pennywise in my face was not not my definition of a good time. However, um, I do want to give it credit. Um, I don't. I don't. I, probably like rewatch it once or twice in my life but like maybe but i do think that bill skarsgård casting was a phenomenal like it's one of those castings where you look back in hindsight and you go, oh yeah obviously like of course that's the only thing that makes sense um he is terrifying like he is so good at being creepy and the like the facial like his talent with his facial expressions is out of this world um and i just think it is a very well made movie i think the pacing is great i think the way that the horror elements are used are really great um i think the cast of kids is wonderful which um isn't always easy to do i think they're all really great um and um yeah i regret that i had to sit through chapter two now that we won't ever talk about it but that's fine um I'm probably the one and only time I'm ever going to vote for it. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Actually. Probably. No, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, uh, Marisol, I'm going to go to you next. Okay. Um, it, my first exposure, I knew, I mean, it's hard to not know who Pennywise the Clown is through like osmosis. He's such a culturally, he's the most famous clown to clown. Uh, maybe Shakes is like a distant second. I don't know. Oh, every, yeah. Everyone knows Shakes. Everyone knows Shakes. But Pennywise <laughs> is like the most iconic. He's the reason people say they're afraid of clowns. Um, I So this, my first actual, I haven't read the book. I haven't seen the original miniseries um, or TV series. Yeah, or, yeah, TV mini. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> Curry joint. Uh, so my first exposure was It. And it was all over the place for me, but deliriously entertaining. But I also love, I think it's a great encapsulation of like some of the best of Stephen King, where he captures, you know, similar to like Stand By Me, where he captures how scary the world is from the view of a, of a kid. But more than like, I, I find this movie so much scarier than like the Conjuring movies, because like 
those I can predict like, you know, like to the beat. But with it, I was like, okay, I think I can predict when something's gonna happen. And it still scared the pants off me. <laughs> it. Like, I was like, Jesus. Like, I was just like, it's so grotesque. Like so much, Pennywise is a, he's a cretin. Like he's <laughs> just, he's so, he's so, disgusting like he's he's your worst nightmare but he doesn't give a shit like what he looks like he doesn't follow any rules and when you see that through the eyes of kids it's even scarier so i do agree i don't i don't hate um chapter two um i i certainly don't hate i actually feel kind of comparable with, with part one i i think they both have strengths and weaknesses um but i do think part one is just it's just what a bad, I love how big of a hit it was. I had no idea it was going to be this big. And I love that little injection into the horror scene that it was just this massive like success. And it is very fun. It brings back the fun and the wonder to scaring people. It's, it's, it's very sentimental. It's the best of Stephen King. Like I said, it's very sentimental, um, but also very, very real and, and digs really down deep into what genuinely scares people. And it's so, creatively visualized by Muschietti. I really love how playful Andy Muschietti is with horror. Um, so it is really good. It is good. And it's gonna definitely get my vote because it's going against About Time, which I think, <laughs> I was revving up for this. I think this is one of the most vile rom-coms of the, 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 the 21st century. I, this movie, impacted me so much when I saw it. I think it is one of the most unromantic things. I don't know where to, really where to start, uh -oh. but but I'll keep this as brief as I can. It's a whole movie about a man who manipulates reality because life isn't good enough for him, even though his life is perfect. He comes from a wealthy family in a beautiful English countryside home. He's a lawyer. He has a loving family. He, um, and he just doesn't think, he thinks that he can't find love. He's the epitome of nice guy, um, the nice guy syndrome. And so he manipulates Rachel McAdams' reality strategically, surgically, to make the perfect way for him to fall in love with her. And we're supposed to find it romantic that he changes her reality every time so that he can have the best chance to make her fall in love with him. And since Richard Curtis, who directed and wrote this, is such a shallow writer, he doesn't make Donald Gleason confront this at any point in the movie, how manipulative and unbalanced their romance is, and that Rachel McAdams has no awareness that she has no say and willpower in their romance. Donald Gleason gets completely off the hook, spoiler, for the end of the movie. Um, and we're supposed to feel bad because his father died. And I think just because Richard Curtis brings subjects up, he doesn't address them in any deeper meaningful way. I think it's very shallow the way he dresses it. And he has some pretty dismissive and disgusting takes about people neglecting other people's free will in this movie. I have nothing but contempt for about time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 I adore the cast. I love Rachel McAdams. She's adorable in it. Donald Gleason is a great actor and he's making the best material. And I love Bill Nye. But I think that the the I think that the ethics behind this movie are very are, are gutter slime. Sorry. I like I agree. I I think the my connection to this is the father-son stuff. That's the strongest part of the film for me. Mm -hmm. I do agree that the romance is definitely the, the weaker side, but I also think that there is an element of it that I think works. But yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, think it absolves everything else he does. No, like, that's you know, you know, he he has to learn how to deal with the passing of his father, which is sad, but it also is, you know, what we all have to deal with. <laughs> I, and, you know, like, I, like, I... I I digress. I'm not going to dig into hard because I know you do like the movie, Jacob. I just want to try to just <laughs> calmly just make my point. That's fair. Like, no, it really that. does not work for me. It's okay. quite That's unromantic. Fair. And it thinks it's so bouncy on a cloud and so cute the entire time. And it's slightly nauseating. <laughs> okay. Adam? That's all I have to say. Get some water. You did well. Thank you. Yeah. I think I was very composed. Um, well, I'll start with about time. And look, I'll, I'll make an attempt to be diplomatic, but I, I, I share a lot of uh, Mario Soul's feelings about this movie. I, I wrote a, a fairly lengthy review about it myself on Letterboxd uh, a year or two ago when I first saw it. And I went in um, kind of excited to finally see the movie um, because I'd heard so much good word of mouth. And um, right off the bat, I wasn't like, it was like a sneaky feeling. Like I'm watching it and it starts sneaking up on me. I'm like, wait a minute, what's he doing to her? I was like, I was, I was like, what is? She doesn't even know 
that he's just like running around like and it's not charming like in Groundhog Day where he has no choice and he learns more about um Andy McDowell as he goes along and that's how he eventually like like charms her like he just he's falling for her because he's stuck in this loop this time loop mm -hmm. and so him learning about her on repeat isn't creepy whereas don't all gleason going in the closet and then coming out of the closet and that's a <laughs> metaphor that doesn't apply to this movie at all and that's a weird thing to, <laughs> to it's how he time travels to yes. evoke yes. out of for no reason you could have used any time travel conceit that didn't matter and he literally goes and hides in a closet and comes out of it i don't like it's an it's an on those metaphor that doesn't apply to the story at all, and I just I don't understand. Um, but then beyond that, I um, uh, child deletion. We've talked about that. Like, you oh, know, sorry, we're talking about we're talking about a lot of spoilers. Okay, okay, I'm okay. sorry, guys. Well, I'm look, sorry. Look, look, are look, you voting? You're not yeah, a you're lot. Not thank you. A lot of about time doesn't hinge on the plot specifics. Let's be honest. It hinges it, it hinges on you know you know the the presumed emotions of the film. So it didn't land with me either. Um, I echo most of what you said. I'll leave it at that. Um, it, I, it does get my vote, but I, I just got to say something real quick. Okay. Um, cause I, I agree with what everyone said about the movie's strengths. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Just all of it. The, the new movies, including chapter two, I, I, it's, it's a mixed bag for me, but I don't hate it. Um, I love the original miniseries, which is also a mixed bag, but the book, is one of my favorite books I've ever read. I've read it five times. Uh, four once was an audio book because I heard Stephen Weber did the audio book and I had to hear it. He was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so go listen to that audio book. But um, uh, when this was in development, I was really excited about it. That's when uh, Fukunaga was going to do it and he had this like like specific vision for it. And then they handed it over to Muschietti. And I think he did a really good job, especially with the first movie because those kids are the the heart of the movie. Um, and uh, But what I, what I think would serve the story well is if in another 25 or 27 years, if you do this story again, do it as a, an actual series because it's a thousand page book and you have all these weird concepts that get introduced in chapter two and don't make sense to most audiences because they're just stated and then they don't really make sense visually. And so I know we're talking only talking about the first one, but none of that's set up in the first movie and it should have been. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's honestly one of my, my complaints about the first movie, even though I really, really like it. Um, I, I think so much works about it. Um, I love that Bill Skarsgård took this role and ran with it and, and became a star who didn't have to put makeup on his face every time. Um, I think it's really, really impressive that he was Pennywise the Clown and we know his face. Like, you know those yeah, eyes. we know. Yeah. Um, so there wasn't even any digital effects on his eyes. Those are just his eyes. I know. He just goes wonky. They, he they can control his like eyes. That. Yeah. Like um, so, yeah, we spent enough time on it. I think it's unanimous. It. It's my book. Yep. It moves on. All right. Taylor. No. I'm sorry. I am going to start with you on this Oof. one, though. Oh, wow. Oof. Thanks. La La Land versus yeah. Marriage Story. Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> this is the personal attack on Taylor. Yeah. One. Yeah. This, is, this one's rough in the first bracket, too. Like, <laughs> damn. You're not even going to let me have a moment. <laughs> Um, so, so, okay. <laughs> I don't even know where to start with this. I love both these movies a lot. It's tough for me because, like, I know which one I'm going to vote for. <laughs> and I'm like, but I love the other one. So I'm like, it's not that it's a tough choice. It's that I have to kill the other one knowing that I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> so anyone that, like, knows me even a little bit, like should know that La Land is top five movies for me all time, like ever. Um, so I can't vote against it. I will not vote against it, even though that means that I have to yeet my beloved Adam Driver movie. <laughs> um, I, I love Marriage Story. I know it started getting memed to death on the internet when it came out because people took one scene out of context and, well, two scenes really out of context and just started deciding it was a bad movie. Um, but I really do think that uh, Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson have great chemistry in the movie. I think it's really well acted. I think Noah Baumbach does a great job with directing the film. I think Laura Dern absolutely kills it. Alan Alda absolutely kills it. Like, it's, it's just, it's not an easy movie to watch. It's really a confronting movie about marriage and relationships and family. 
Um, but I think it's really, really well done. And I do want to give it its flowers because um, I, I do love the movie. It was one of my favorites of that year. Um, but La La Land is my beloved. <laughs> La La Land is the movie that like makes me emotional every time I watch it. I think it's a wonderful love story. I think it's one of the best movies we have about right person, wrong time. That's a trope that just gets me right here where it's like, yeah, you can tell they were meant to be together, but the timing when they met and were trying to get together was like just not going to work. And I think it's such a beautiful movie about, you know, the the reality sometimes of having to confront that, of feeling like you've met your right person, but you have to decide, you know, are you going to follow those dreams if that means that you can't be with the person you think is the right person? Like, what kind of decision do you make? How do you decide who you're going to be and what you're going to do and, and what's best for you? Um, and I think it's a really great movie about what it kind of costs to try and follow your dreams and how much you're personally like willing to give of yourself to do it and how much you have to sacrifice um, just on an emotional and a mental level. Um, and I think it's, it's a really beautiful film about heartbreak in so many different ways. Um, and a really beautiful um, just piece of art, like the, the set design and the use of color and the cinematography um, the musical numbers, I love that it is a movie that is so unafraid and unashamed of the fact that it is a musical and has these big dance numbers. Um, and yeah, I I just really, really love this movie a lot. So I'm really glad that it's in this bracket, but I'm also really terrified that it's in this bracket. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, Marisol, I'm going to go you next. Okay. I'm next? Yeah. Oh, Okay. Um, yeah, this is an interesting matchup. Um, yeah, La La Land is, is a movie with some major, major, major peaks, uh, some major highs. The strength, obviously, being the production design is beautiful. We always love, we're always waiting for a resurgence of musicals, and La La Land hit, like, at the right time when people were starved. And I totally get why it was such a major hit. I do think um, the planetarium scene is an absolute high. Just again, the production design and Justin Hurwitz's music are the, the bangers in this movie. And the final scene, like you say, Taylor, right? like realizing that montage of realizing what you, your life could be, you know, is one of the absolute best scenes in the movie. What a fantastic scene, great way to end the movie, bittersweet way to end the movie. And, my thing with La La Land is that I think it's very flat vocally. I think that it has a presentation of everything, but I think that the talent on screen doesn't match the grandeur of the production design. So the dancing is solid, but not exceptional. We're not exactly watching a stare and Ginger Rogers. And just because they are making homages to the, that era of stuff doesn't necessarily mean they're succeeding and it doesn't make it instantly like movie magic. But I really re respect them for trying. Also, the thing when this movie started out, the, the the opening number on the bridge is amazing. I love the music kicking in, but then I could barely hear the vocals. Like the, the singing in the movie is so mousy. Everybody's, it's a little underwhelming. So that I always get kind of torn in between that. But La La Land has some incredible peaks in it. Um, like I said, the production design to that. And so it's tough putting it against um, Marriage Story, which is this generation's Kramer versus Kramer. Like it is, it is, and Kramer versus Kramer is great. Um, uh, but man, that is that puts you through the bitchiness, bitterness of divorce and a marriage falling apart and two people just embittered in this battle. And so Marriage Story can't say is a good time, but it's it's a magnetic time. And it's just an actor showcase like Kramer versus Kramer was. Um, where you, and But I think Marriage Story, unlike Kramer versus Kramer, I think it has a really great balance between the two sides in the marriage, which I really, really admire it for. Um, and I love the levity from the supporting cast. Like Laura Dern is incredible. And I love I love her popping in. She almost doesn't seem like she fits in the movie. She looks like she's having too much fun. Like she's like, what are you guys so serious about? Like in that movie. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Driver and Johansson just go for broke in it. It is an acting showcase, that film. Um, so I, I'm going to go with Marriage Story. Um, I'm always more conflicted on La La Land, but I totally understand the ardent like love and passion. I totally get why so many people have for La La Land. It's, it has too many highs, but like weaknesses for me. So it kind of meets in the middle and Marriage Story Out does it for me. Mara? 
This is tough. Uh, it really, really is. Because really, these are two movies that are about the disillusion of genuine deep love, just mm -hmm. in different ways. Mm -hmm. One of them makes you feel kind of like it's bittersweet at the end. And the other one is like, man, I feel like I've just been through some trauma. Um, <laughs> this was triggering. But uh, the, I, I, I kind of formulated what I was going to think as everyone was talking. Um, sometimes it's not about me picking my favorite or even what I necessarily think is best when, when I'm voting in this. Uh, I'm going to pick what I think did the most as far as like an achievement in filmmaking, because I am not saying that marriage story is any random drama. It is not, it is some of the best acting. Uh, it, it really is like physically anxiety inducing and it it was it's fantastic uh and i really really enjoyed it but la la land it was an originally composed musical they shut down la freeways they filmed outside they choreographed and yes they are not professional dancers it is very obvi and no they are not professional singers it's also obvi i really wish they would have written emma stone in her uh, strongest vocal range for more than one song but like at the same time it is palatable and I have many of those songs on my mix for when I shower, when I run, when I drive. Like mm -hmm. it is, uh, it's just an achievement mm -hmm. in filmmaking because people don't take the time to craft a film like that uh, very frequently in this day and age. So I'm not necessarily saying it's my favorite of the two or that it is better than the other, but because of what it contributed to the filmmaking canon, I'm going to vote for La La Land. Um, this was, this is really tough for me as well, just because, um, Marriage Story was a movie that hit really hard, really mm -hmm. hard for me when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And, um, like I was, I, I was convinced and that's the parasite year, but I was convinced it was winning everything. I was like, oh my God, this thing's like, this thing's one of the best movies of the year. It's like, I love marriage story, but this is a, that's what this bracket's going to be. A move that one that's one of the best of the years versus one that's best of the decade. And uh, La La Land's one of my all time favorite movies. Um, it's not my number one and therefore I hate <laughs> it apparently. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but La La Land is one of my all-time favorite movies, and I, yeah, that's uh, I have to give uh, La La Land my vote, and um, it sucks because I really love Marriage Story as well. And I, was I really you did this would, to I us, know, Jacob. I know <laughs> this is your fault. Yeah, Adam, I vote for the um, the child of these two movies, Annette. <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's move on. No. Um. Uh. Marriage Story is great. Um. You know, Noah Baumbach was very upfront about you know the autobiographical elements, which you know most writers draw from their lives, but that was pretty direct, and I appreciate that because it lent authenticity to what was going on. Um. And I think that even though you have uh, characters who are immersed in the industry. So you could, you know, arguably, you know, like that, that might limit the appeal to certain audiences maybe, but like, I think he does such a good job of grounding the characters, even though they are in the entertainment industry. And, um, you know, that's not really the focus that's incidental. And, um, it's really just about these two really talented actors showing us everything they've got. And I really, really love that about it. Um, uh, and with La La Land, um, uh, I agree with the, um, things everyone's saying about production design and, and all of that. I have, um, I actually have the, the, the vinyl, um, and I, I love throwing that on once in a while. It was one of the first records, um, my daughter ever danced to actually. Mm -hmm. She was, when she was one year old, she was in her little walker thing. And um, the opening, uh, the opening song from the, the highway came on, and and Another she just started hopping song. like involuntarily oh. to it. I'll show you guys the video later. It's real. 
Um, <laughs> uh, so that, you know, that's great. Um, let's give a shout out to uh, John Legend in this movie because, like, oh, I shit. love him in 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 uh, La La Land. Um, and I love his song in La La Land. It's one yes, of the best. I know we're supposed to hate it. I know we're supposed to hate it, but I love I know. <laughs> That thank you. I'm sorry, can I just yeah, that's one of the weirdest things. I'm sorry, that is one of the weirdest things. Like I went like I was like, sit down, Ryan Gosling, because he's all like, What the hell is this? And I'm like, this is a banger, that's what it is. Like, like yeah. I was like, we could start a fire. Like, yes. I, I thought it was I weird because I was like, we're supposed John, to hate this. No, song? but John Legend's like, also poking fun at himself a little bit. He's no, having a good time with himself. It's really, really smart. <laughs> yeah. And I call the unintentional villain like, song. <laughs> like it's it's meant like it's meant to be a villain song, and it's like not <laughs> <laughs> right. um it's too good justin was too good was so i really like all of that i also um my personal relationship with la outside of the schmodown was you know a semester in college um that was my introduction to la i went out there very bright-eyed and bushy-tailed very excited and it was like the entire like arc that the characters went through with like the entertainment industry in la la land in six months like i went in like oh wow, look at all this. And then like at the end of that semester, I was like, I got to reassess a few things. And <laughs> I, like, like there's still things I like about this town, but oh damn, that was a lot of reality. Oh boy. <laughs> and I really relate to the reality that they deal with in that. Um, that's why I, um, even though I agree with what you said about the limitations of the vocal range of, the, of, of Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone, I still like the emotion, the emotion in their performance, mm -hmm. especially yeah. her song at the end. That song got me, I had a very strong response to that at the end because I thought it was a very good uh, performance. Um, so I vote for La La Land. I just wanted to give it its credit. Marriage Story is great as well. But if you like Marriage Story and you like La La Land, go see Annette. Cause yes. yes. Oh, my and God. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I just want to quickly say I had Jacob go see that movie with me and he hadn't seen a trailer. I, he knew nothing about it. That was my oh, favorite wait. thing oh, wow. of watching him to figure out what the hell was in front of him. <laughs> it's it was wonderful. All right. All right. We are we uh, we're four down. Um, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> all right. Oh, this is going to be interesting. Mission Impossible Fallout versus Crazy Rich Asians. <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's the name of the mission, next Mission Impossible. Yeah, movie. yeah that is. <laughs> Mara, I'm going to go to you first. All right, all right. I can, I can actually, I can piece my way through this. Um, <laughs> I don't think that it always has to boil down to, is it my favorite Mission Impossible movie in the franchise? It doesn't have to boil down to that. I mean, I'm going to start and just tell you, I'm going to vote for Crazy Rich Asians. Um, I, I do really love Mission Impossible Fallout. It is not my favorite Mission Impossible movie, <laughs> just FYI. Um, I do really like it. I've seen it, I've seen it at least a dozen times. Like truly, it's one of my fall asleep on the plane while I'm on a shitload of um, Valium movies. So I really have seen it like a lot because I fly a lot. Um, I like I like it, but uh, I like other movies. I like another movie more fine but crazy rich asians i i think that as far as like rom-coms go because that is not my speed it i am not the target audience like like i get it demographically because people will point it out in the chat as they have demographically i am the target audience for a rom-com but like this identity is not the target audience for a rom-com not whatsoever <laughs> but um it has something to say like it points out the difference in how uh Chinese persons will treat other Chinese persons differently based on origin and upbringing, like, you know, Chinese Americans, uh, like, it's not even just about like, social status of wealth. Like, I, I like that there, there was something to say there. Um, it is very funny. I think it's sweet. Henry Golding, that was kind of my first real big thing with him. And I was like, I guess I can see it. I, I, I suppose I, I, acknowledge that that's there for people but i mean it's Gemma chan that's why i'm there so <laughs> um the the moisture factor is real um ah, moisture is that the first <laughs> reference of moisture yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. market ding it <laughs> ding. <laughs> and i think and Gemma chan totally earns it by the way um she is fire she can do no wrong please don't tell me that she's like done anything wrong ever because i'll have to cry but no um I, I, i'm sure we'll maybe 
probably not get into more about one of these films later. Yeah. Maybe it'll be this one. But um, but no, I have revisited it several times as far as the fact that it's a rom-com goes. Really shocking that it's it's probably in my top five rom-coms of all time, uh, even though that list is probably pretty short. But I, I love Mission Impossible Fallout. It will definitely win this this part of the bracket. And I'm not going to be mad about it either. So, but I'm going to vote for Crazy Rich Asians. Um, Adam. This is interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, it's been a long time since we got to talk about a Mission Impossible movie, Jacob. So thank you. <laughs> um, uh, totally. Yeah, no. I, when Fallout came out, um, I remember at that point, I was like, I had checked out a Mission Impossible for a couple movies. I'd seen Ghost Protocol after it came out and liked it. But then I didn't see Rogue Nation when it came out. And then I, when Fallout came out, I was like, okay, I went back and I rewatched Ghost Protocol and Rogue Nation. I didn't watch the whole franchise. Um, and that teed me up. So I was really dialed in for Fallout. So um, I, I really liked it at the time. Um, uh, I'll never forget though, something that traumatized me and this has nothing to do with the movie. Um, I went and saw it, uh, when I was traveling for work, I had a, a uh, where I traveled for work at the time and I would sometimes get gaps in my schedule where I could sneak in a matinee of a movie. Right. So I, I went and I, I, I was in like, uh, Connecticut at the time and I went and I saw this movie at like one in the afternoon. And then, um, during the the end when the helicopter well we can talk can we yeah, yeah, we, can yeah, talk, yeah. we can talk spoilers about mission impossible follow right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so during the helicopter scene and not like when it's like falling like over the edge of the mountain like towards the end that whole sequence um i got a call from my boss that could not be ignored and i had to step out of the theater during that entire scene oh and oh. i was really upset and i came <laughs> back in it's okay they all made it yeah 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 i know um so that was uh i i have since recovered and seen the movie many times hence uh so yeah. that's great i had a similar experience growing up with hook i had a, a taped copy from tv that didn't have the ending on it that sucked um <laughs> so i really really like mission impossible fallout i like the physicality of henry cavill in this movie um uh -huh. crazy rich asians was such a surprise when it came out and i and i appreciate all the reasons why um, I think it has a lot of staying power as an ensemble comedy, as a refreshing romantic comedy with some mature ideas on its mind. I like that it gets into the specifics of, um, you know, uh, the different cultures it's addressing, but also, you know, like watching it, like growing up in Ohio, there's so much I, like I related to in that movie, um, you know, throughout the entire thing and laughed at. And I'll admit I've watched Mission Impossible fall out more. It's more of a go-to, like, like exciting movie for me to watch. Um, but I, I'm i not trying to be chaotic here. I want to give Crazy Rich Asians its due with the disclaimer that I've watched Mission Impossible Fallout more, and I'll continue to watch it more because it's easy to watch. But I think Crazy Rich Asians is special, and I want to give it a shot here, so I'm going to vote for it. I think they're both really good movies at what they do, and I just, yeah, I'm trying to be fair here. Taylor. Uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Aristotle, do you? Oh, uh, yeah, I do. Okay. All right, I'll hit this you is, up. This is, okay, me? Okay, yeah, this is a wild matchup because, like, like, yeah, like, how different could two movies be? Yeah, like, two very, be? very different movies. So I'm trying, I've been trying to think of, like, where to begin. Like, how do you compare? Um, and I'm going to say this. Mission Impala, uh, Mission, Mission Impala. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mission Impossible Fallout. Um is definitely one of my favorites of the entire run. Um, I look, fangirl over here, I am all on the Henry Cavill of it all. I'm on the moment where he like knuckles up right before he goes in that like, it's perfection. And they knew they had gold with that and they leaned into it. I love, I, I, Henry Cavill is such, such a great foil in this movie. He is a real little high point. Um, and it is Mission Impossible. It excels and has some phenomenal, phenomenal set pieces. I will say this, but Mission Impossible, you know what you're going to get from it. And it executes it fantastically. It's a great time. It's top tier action. But what Crazy Rich Asians offers is a unique experience. Like it is, you know, I can find an experience like Mission Impossible Fallout as much as I like it. I could find theatrical experiences like that. And there's this, there's a endearing quality to the uniqueness of crazy rich Asians. I had no expectations. I never read the book. 
any of the books about um, about it when it came out. And I felt a serious return to traditional good old fashioned rom-coms, not the bullshit ones for the 2000s where it's like the battle of the sexes and people are lying to each other. And like, you find out that, oh, you're not who I thought you were. Not bullshit rom-com, rom-coms about adults entering a stage in the relationship and dealing with actual shit. Like, how do we make our relationship work? Here are the conflicts with my family. Like you're saying, Mara, like it's illuminating that movie. It's fluffy, it's effervescent, it's bubbly, it's lavish. I mean, these Asians are rich and they're and they're crazy and it's Singapore. It's a, it's a world you haven't seen, especially for an American audience. It's an illuminating movie, not because it's an incredible movie or it's not because it breaks the mold or does anything completely unconventional, but it is so spirited. All the performances are spirited. This is the best Constance Wu has ever been in anything that I've seen her in. She's, she's, she's delightful. Michelle Yeoh crushes it in this movie. I will never forget this. There's a scene where she destroys, I'm just going to say, there's a scene where she destroys Constance Wu. Like, like, cause the whole thing is that Constance Wu is trying to get her approval. And there's a scene between her and Michelle Yeoh where Michelle Yeoh is just, she, it's, She's terrifying, and but like so soft spoken, and it sears in my brain. She destroys in this scene. It's one of the best scenes in the whole movie. Michelle Yeoh is majestic. Um, yeah, Crazy Rich Asians is really fun. It's illuminating. I said that already. I'm actually gonna vote for it over Fallout just because when you're really trying to compare these two, I can find experiences like Fallout. I can find experiences like Fallout, and Fallout is a fun, great Mission Impossible movie. But it ain't better than Bros Ghost Protocol. That's all I gotta say, y'all. That's it. That's my that's my final line. Okay. Are you okay? I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> this is an upset right I did not see coming. Legit. Legit. Right when I did my assumption, because I went at the start of, I went through and I have assumptions <laughs> of where I think this is all gonna go. Straight up. Well, you know what assumptions do. I know. I, know. I straight up yeah. went. This is a five zero win for Fallout. I cannot believe this. <laughs> Well done. Like, wow. Um, do you want to talk about Fallout? Okay. So, like, look, I love Crazy Rich Asians. Like, Crazy Rich Asians is a fantastic movie. Um, it is, I, I think, the, I, I, I think the um, wedding scene is one of the most beautiful, like, one of the most romantic scenes I have ever seen on film. It is gorgeous and beautiful and the way he looks at her and oh it is so just gorgeous and absolutely beautiful but wow um <laughs> oh. Oh, is just... i love how we i love how before this we were like oh we're not really a rom-com group like we don't really and then we're like well crazy rich asians <laughs> like, I, 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 okay i will admit i agree with everything you said that you know, that I do agree. We've got literally two other Mission Impossibles in this bracket. It must be we nice. Know. As a John Wick fan, I wouldn't know. <laughs> we don't have anything else like um, Crazy Rich Asians. Like I, so I agree with from that uh, from that aspect. I'm actually really happy that Crazy Rich Asians has gone through. Um, but man, Henry Cavill, guy, Carl, Henry Cavill in this goddamn movie was just that. He is so good, just so freaking good in this as the villain and as just this dynamic presence through the entire film of, oh, where has this guy been in Hollywood? Like, hey, And talking about like memorable scenes, can we talk about the um, skydiving? Yeah. Like, like, oh my God. Like, oh, the, yeah. The open the, the scene where the, the halo jump is like incredible, but I, I just like this movie alone just went, Man, Hollywood's wasted Henry Cavill like completely wet. Like, I like him as Superman, I think he's a very good Superman, but we didn't really get to see it. We didn't really like he just has been completely wasted in movies this his entire career. They don't know what to do with him, they really don't, and it's devastating. Um. I really love Fallout. I uh, like Fallout. It's an incredible, it's like a visually stunning film. Um, the, uh, uh, what I, I call it, like, it's the most, like, what I, I, it's the thing that I really love is I, you can feel the weight of the camera and it's done. Mm -hmm. 
really dumb way to call, or say it, but like when you compare it to Ghost Protocol or Rogue Nation, where it's very fast, it's very quick. You, um, I, I just think with with Fallout, because they were shooting it on IMAX a lot more, you can feel the weight of those IMAX cameras, and you can really feel the deliberate slow pace of the camera movements. I, I, it's just, a, it's a step up in filmmaking from Christopher McQuarrie. And I, I, it's, I think it's his best directed work so far. Um, not my favorite of his movies, but it's his best. I think it's his best directing. Uh, so yeah, fallout. It's all for naught, but yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. I would have voted fallout Taylor. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say too much just because I feel like everything's kind of been said at this point. Um, and we will get to talk about Crazy Rich Asians again. So I will talk about it again when we get to that point. I love it. I think it's a really great movie. It's so fun. It, Like everyone said, it really has something to say in a way we haven't seen in a rom-com before. Um, my only uh, gripe with it is we are not going to get the sequel so we don't get any more of Harry Shum Jr. and Gemma Chan, which is very upsetting <laughs> because that's supposed to be the sequel. If, like Book-wise, yeah. that's supposed to be what's next. But anyway, I digress. Well, I'll talk more about Crazy Rich Asians later. I love Fallout as well, but I guess it doesn't matter. It's not. <laughs> I'm cool. We roll. Yeah. Wow. First major upset of the tournament. Wow. Crazy Rich Asians takes out Mission Impossible Fallout. We have lost the, the first Mission Impossible movie to fall. <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally the first one to go. Wow. It helps when you're not in a wild card bracket, I guess. Yeah. Oh. All right. Next yeah, up. Bad over there. This is the this is uh Taylor vs. Mara. I yeah, apologize I so. for this. Oh, don't say that. Pain and Glory vs. Jane Eyre. Whoa. Oh. Huh? Oh. <laughs> oh yeah i told you this is t this is taylor versus mara um i don't think well, in the way you guys think though <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's probably flipped from what everyone's expecting yeah 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 i, I, yeah. I will agree with that um taylor i'm gonna let you uh, start okay so pain and glory is a movie that you and I went in without knowing anything about it. We had a screening to it, like when we lived in Brisbane mm. and we knew nothing about it. We were like, Oh, we'll go to a screening. It'll be a fun time. We just started getting press screenings. So we were like, Oh yeah. All right. We should probably go and, to this uh, foreign film. It was a fun time, but Oh boy. I was like a mess after seeing this movie. It <laughs> Antonio Banderas in this movie is <laughs> astonishing. And I was mm -hmm. like, I was blown away by it because I think he's a great actor, but this was like something completely, completely different. And Penelope Cruz as well was incredible in this movie. I love Pedro's use of color in this movie. It's so specific and it's so vibrant. Um, and it was just really one of those movies that I never would have expected to see just like I don't know. It's it's one of those movies that stuck with me ever since I saw it. I saw it and I was just like, that is just going to always be in my brain forever. Um, I, It's a very like, near and dear movie to me just because of that. Like It's one of those experiences where that's what like movies should be. You go into the movie and you're like, wow. That is just hit me in like my emotions. It hit me in the way of it's incredible filmmaking like it's gorgeous and it's emotional um just really awesome that being said i also do jane eyre this adapt like adaptation of jane eyre is so interesting like it the the tone is not something i would have expected um out of like this kind of what you would expect to be a typical period piece it almost feels like it is almost kind of also like a horror movie but maybe that's just because Michael Fassbender, I don't find him charming particularly. I think he's more just like creepy and scary a little bit in this movie. Um, but I, I was fascinated by it. Like, it's just not, I don't think I've ever seen another period piece kind of from this era that kind of goes with that tone and is like told in that way. Um, so I really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was, it really stands out to me. Um, but I, I have to vote for my beloved pain and glory. All right, Mara. Uh, 
no shade on pain and glory, by the way, just, just to start off in that way. Um, oh dear. One of my cats is playing with the other one's butthole. Oh. <laughs> I just mean in case there's like a splash of black and white across the screen. That's why. Um, Jane Eyre is one of my top. It's like it, it vies for my top in the top two favorite books of all time. I absolutely love, and which is crazy also because not should not be my thing. Um, I love the title character. She's one of the only female characters that I find any common ground with because she actually like becomes a person of agency and autonomy and in a way that doesn't feel contrived and stop it. Um, sorry. She's really going to town down there. It's like, she feels like she's at a Dunkin' Donuts. Um, <laughs> America runs on it, guys. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I love the aesthetic. I think it's a gorgeous movie, which normally things in like more muted color palettes don't really work for me, especially being color deficient. But like anything pseudo gothic is really going to work for me. Um, I do think that uh, the locations that were used, especially the exteriors, because uh, they went uh, outside because, you know, you can actually make movies outside just you know hey hollywood but uh i will say this i think that michael fassbender does a great job acting he is terribly miscast though because mr rochester is supposed to be like kind of fugly like he's not supposed to be a handsome dude <laughs> but anyways um i really really love the movie it i i've seen every single uh, like movie or TV movie adaptation of Jane Eyre. This one is head and shoulders above. Uh, I think it's somewhat underappreciated because I don't think a lot of people have seen it. It is long, so and it's deliberate, and it has a lot of not talking. So I know that that can be somewhat off-putting for people, but the score is divine. It is just, it's just one of those really beautiful movies that's worth watching once. And I actually really love Pain and Glory. This is painful to do, but I feel like Pain and Glory is going to move forward. And I'm not going to be mad about that, but I have to give my girl her vote because the one female title character movie that'll like have me my <laughs> vociferous support, I got to do it. So Jane Eyre it is. All right. Um, Adam. So I, um, uh, I'm more than happy to admit that these were a couple movies that I caught up on for the show um uh and yeah yeah that's that's one of the fun parts about doing this um but i i watched them both in their entirety and really glad i did because they were both really solid films um pain and glory i uh, uh of the almodovar films i've seen um this one is definitely uh, you know keeping in pace with the quality uh like uh, what's different though is this is the you know this is the autobiographical one and i'll tell you what as someone who wasn't crazy about the Fablemans, this movie really, really tickled my fancy in all the right ways. Because, like, I you have to you have to if a director is going to do the autobiographical movie, there needs to be a good hook. And and this this what I like about Pain and Glory that it does it kind of gets out of the way is you get um, a lot of the narration right out of the gate. You understand who this character is. You understand how Motivar is talking about himself in a lot of ways but you have a good sense of, of who Salvador is. Mm -hmm. And then when it, 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 it just pivots in ways that I won't ruin for people who haven't seen it, but it just, it goes, it introduces characters in really dynamic mm -hmm. ways that keep changing up the pace of the film for the better and, and show you different sides of this character who going into it, I initially thought might be a little frustrating to deal with. And Antonio Banderas is deservedly nominated. He's excellent. Um, I love the way it, it uh, it's got an incredible sense of humor, as most out of our films do. Uh, the color palette is great, especially the reds. That's his favorite color, I would assume, because that's in everything. Um, <laughs> it's so much red that I even was like, is that like green screen? It's so red. <laughs> but like, no, no, it's just the way it's shot. Um, um, uh, and the movie made me laugh a lot. Um, uh, in, and... So yeah, I, I got to think about this for a second. Jane Eyre, um, been wanting to see it for a long time. Um, and, you know, um, what I've seen of Fukunaga's directing work, 
Um, I'm very impressed. Season one of True Detective. I think No Time to Die is solid. Um, I, I, I think it's a little clunky, but it's solid. Um, but and I still got to see Sin Hombre, which I hear is great. Uh, I've always wanted to see that movie. Um, but we're not doing the 2000s yet. Uh, <laughs> um, with with Jane Eyre, um, what sets this apart right out of the gate is just that you are there. It's not it's not play acting. It's not theater. Like it's on location. Like Mara said, it's so immersive. Um, somehow they made the fog their bitch in this movie. It did exactly what it wanted them to the whole movie. Like the fog's a character. Um, I thought so much of Hitchcock's Rebecca watching this, uh, a movie I love. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's got similar themes. It's not, I don't want people to think it's like the same story because it's different, different time periods and whatnot, but there's some overlap there. Mm. Um, made me miss, uh, mm -hmm. Mia Wasikowska quite a bit. Um, you know, um, I, I, no, she like stepped away for a bit and now we have Anya Taylor joy, but like we can let them both act. Right. <laughs> like they can, they can both do these period pieces, but th no, she's really, really good in this. And she makes the character so well-rounded and so fully realized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Charlotte Bronte did a really good job, mm -hmm. you know, bucking tradition at the time, calling out the hypocrisy mm -hmm. of gender norms and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. this movie takes it to task in very direct ways. Um, I agree with what you're saying about Fassbender being cast, but he also is just so good that I wasn't mad. Like he's just so excellent. And there's the Kieran Hines version. So there you go. All due respect to Kieran Hines. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's a little more homely compared to Fassbender, I would guess. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm sure he's watching right now and he'll never talk to me again. Um, and then, yeah, the score is from uh, Dario Marianelli who did uh, atonement won an Oscar for that. And this score is fantastic. It's just, it's it sweeps you off your feet. And I know you said it's long, Mara, but I didn't feel that. It's two hours, but it's pretty lean, especially for a movie like this, mm -hmm. a movie that could easily be a miniseries and has been many mm -hmm. times. So I think they do a good job of, like, streamlining it. And, oh, God. You know, these are both so fresh, too, Jacob, which makes me more irritated. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about them longer and different, you know, see these both at least get out of the opening round. <sighs> Um, okay. Look, I really, I love Almodovar's work. I respect, I respect everything he's saying in this movie. I think it's incredibly impactful, but I'm going to vote for Jane Eyre by a hair, by an air, uh, hair um, by a hair, because it's just hair by a hair. like Taylor said, the, the tone, the, the horror flavor in this is so great. It's so subtle and they get away with just a couple things that make you second guess was it's just, I, I really like the way this is directed. It's, it's so thought out and and it's completely overlooked like mara said so i'll vote for jane Eyre. let's keep this interesting marisol have you no do you need to go you need to go <laughs> i okay. this is like all right so well you're brutal. okay you're gonna have no, the deciding part then no but I, have to, to but I have to say it but this is what i have to say it this is so brutal this is happening in this round because i feel like this is the most back and forth everybody said about this I haven't seen Jane Eyre still. Uh, this is crushing. That's why, like every every single listen to everyone you talk, I'm like, oh, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I'm like, God damn it! Like this is like of the all the matchups for me to like have not seen like one of the movies. I feel like this is like the most like splitting hair, like the most closely contested of any of them so far. And so I'm like dying inside right now because like so I, I to just go and just pick uh, something so maybe my vote won't matter well okay unfortunately it is because i liked jane Eyre. i didn't oh. love i loved pain and glory like i i just i really love pain and glory whereas in jane Eyre, i think it's just the the story like i don't know i it just there's something about it i just didn't like, i didn't connect with it the way that i was cut like because i without realizing i actually do really like period films like the you know yeah because like, he was like oh do, i don't really want to watch jane Eyre. i don't really like period films and i was like well you liked pride and prejudice 2005 and you liked emma <laughs> with Anya Taylor joy and you liked and he's and like, like oh okay yeah, i guess yeah, i do yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay we kind of went through all and it was like okay i do and then this one i don't know i just kind of i i think maybe i just didn't like the coldness i didn't like i i wasn't into the I it, it just there's something about it that didn't quite resonate with me as much 
personally like i really do i love the performances i think that um the people who are in it like uh they do their best and i just inherently just not a massive fan of the inherent story that's being told i guess so i i am going to go pain and glory so that means you're the deciding vote well, 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 well fuck me okay <laughs> uh wow so yeah so two two for pain and glory two for jane Eyre. man cool this it's is... not like you're voting for a bad movie no matter what you pick yeah, like, yeah. You know, no one's gonna be yeah. mad let me not lose sleep over this i yeah i'll i'll, I'll i won't bury I'll, I'll yeah i won't belabor it i do have to just vote for pain and glory because it's the one that i saw and not only it's the one that i've seen it's the one that like I had a very emotional reaction to like, like I'm not just like, oh, I'm just voting for because it's the one I seen. It was one of my favorite films that that year it came out. And for all the reasons you're saying the, 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 you know, the autobiography, I think it's a fascinating way to, to tell your story, to turn your story, to reflect on your life and take elements of your life and turn elements of your life into art. And I think it is just beautifully layered and poetic. I, I, I wish I had seen Jane Eyre so I could like compare these two more, but, I really genuinely love pain and glory. So I, by default, I'm easily going to vote for it. Sorry, Jane Eyre there. I love Fassbender though. I, I, have no <laughs> excuse for not, I have no excuse for not having seen Jane Eyre at this point. It's like one of the only films of his I haven't seen yet for some reason, because it's so unavailable. I'm, I'm a little, I'm making excuses. I'm a little baby. Fun fact, fun fact. It was on sale. Uh, it was a dollar yeah, more to it. buy it digitally than it was yeah. to rent yeah. it. So I was like, sweet. Yeah, yeah so we earned it now. I'm so we sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right Sorry. moving on oh, uh, this all right marisol this is your this is your comeuppance for not having watched jane air <laughs> for midnight verse eighth grade okay jacob <laughs> see you think you're cute and you think you're funny and you think you're cute but i got a news flash for you uh i have, i'm gonna make myself an acai bowl really quick can i go last please absolutely yeah. all right marisol Oh, oh, I gotta go first. That's yeah. what you're gonna do on top of it. Yeah. Go first. Yeah, rip, rip the band-aid off. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> so asshole. I did <laughs> uh, <laughs> these are two of I think uh, uh, let's just put this out there. These are two of my favorite films of the 2010s. Um, and so I really had to think long and hard this week, asshole, about about which one I was gonna pick. Okay. Because I just had to be like, let's just get academic about it. Let's leave emotions out of this, asshole. Um, and and I decided <laughs> that <laughs> I was going to be a big girl and I was going to be mature about it and just stick to the facts and just break these down objectively as films. So that's what I'm going to try to do here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just to get that last one out. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, all right. Eighth grade, Bo Burnham. He shocked me by this because I did like him, but I had no idea he had this in him. I had no idea he had this level of sensitivity. And I feel like eighth grade is a movie that captures a generation. You feel it when you see it. I think the eighth grade captures a voice, an unseen voice in a generation. I feel like I understood what a kid is going through now. That I'm not, I'm definitely not a kid anymore, but I feel like I, I felt, I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I felt like I understood this. I think this is a supremely sensitive thoughtful, tasteful movie um, that doesn't need to get too, too heavy about anything to have it have a lot of emotional weight and gravitas and fantastic naturally, almost all except for Josh Hamilton, the dad in this, almost all like amateur actors. Like they're just kids. Like these are like a lot of their first movies. And Ellie Parker, is that the, no. Ellie Parker. Elsie uh, Fisher. Ellie, Elsie, Elsie Fisher. Ellie Parker's a Naomi Watts movie, I think. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, Elsie Fisher, fantastic, natural, effortlessly natural performance trying to just act like somebody acting natural. I don't know how to describe that a little better, but it's just astounding performance for such a young, inexperienced actor. And very sweet. Again, like I said, very endearing without having to get too, too deep, but very, very, very sincere. And emotionally reaching movie and a beautiful story about a father just trying to connect with his daughter and a daughter just trying to just put outward confidence in the world while battling with all these inner insecurities and anxiety. I think it's a 
And Bo Burnham, how would Bo Burnham even know? Like he did so much research. He put so much care into making this feel authentic. And that's not an effort you really see. He really took his debut really seriously. And it is just an astounding debut. And I think a capture a generation defining film about adolescence. Fuck you, Jacob. <laughs> Because on the other side of this matchup is Before Midnight, which is an encapsulation of one of the greatest, most soulful and honest and emotionally honest endeavors in cinema, I think, which is taking a relationship, all stages of relationship. It's a capper to the Before trilogy, and the actors are 20 years later, and it is talking about what not enough movies talk about. It is also, I think a defining, a generation defining movie. It is, it captures what happens in a relationship 20 years after the fact, which you don't see enough films about. And it's so earned watching these characters after so long. Um, Jesse and, and Selena, just, it's just, it's just, it's so, <sighs> Before Midnight is an astounding accomplishment. It's incredible. I love, I love all the, all the, the 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 sparkle the the magic the the first love we're all at a different point in this couple's lives they're married they have children i can't, I can't I, i'm gonna go on forever i'm just gonna just say you don't see this a lot it's a special these characters are so lived ethan hawk julie delpy they've spent 20 years perfecting these characters they know them you're just looking at people you're looking at life happening in real time there's so much truth and honesty in seeing lives lived, relationships lived, seeing how love evolves, seeing how we're allowed to be human, we're allowed to be resentful, we're allowed to feel these things for each other, be resentful of each other, be at odds with each other, but want to stay with each other. It's it's almost, I, I think it's even stronger than, it, it's a great double feature with Marriage Story, first off, um, that covers very different things, but has a, a, an emotional honesty and rawness to both of them. Before Men, I just, Ah, oh my God. I, I thought I had picked one and I still didn't, even after all that. I'm gonna have to pick one. I'm gonna have to pick one. I'm gonna have to pick one. <laughs> oh, I am gonna have to pick Before Midnight and it destroys me to pick one of these because I think these are two astounding essential films. Fuck. Yeah, I can, right. I can go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just get through this, make this easy. I haven't seen Before Midnight. Um, I saw, what's the first one? Before? Or you saw Before. What's the first one? I'm trying to remember. Before, uh, before Sunrise. Sunrise? Yeah, is Sunrise. that the first one? Sunrise is the first one. Yeah. Okay. I saw Before Sunrise. Did not connect with it at all on any level. And then didn't keep going because I didn't connect with it on any, any level. Um, I am going to try and re-watch it. I'm going to try and sit down and do it a second time and then try to get through all of them. But I just checked out after that first one. So it just didn't happen. Didn't get around to this one. Um, which I know is like a crime against the film community, but that's fine. I'll be that person. Eighth grade, I loved. I've been a big fan of Bo Burnham and his comedy for a long time. I've been watching his his comedy specials for years and years and years. I sat down and had Jacob watch all of them before we watched Inside together. Um, and I just think that he is brilliant. I think that he's so smart and he's so willing to try and understand people that don't see the world through his perspective. He tries to really, he's an artist. Like he really just knows that he is the white male privileged guy and he really tries to do something with that um whether it's putting it into his comedy or i think even the best example of that is this movie in eighth grade of really taking a teenage girl that he would have no ability to really understand what she's going through because he has never he had said in like all of the interviews and all the press conferences you know i've never been a girl i've never been a teenage girl and i've never been a teenage girl in this generation um but he writes it with so much understanding and so much empathy and so much wonder, like so much care about really wanting to put this story on screen in a way that makes that generation feel like they're seen and feel like people can understand what they're going through and what it's like for them to be growing up. 
And I think one of the scenes that sticks with me the most is when we see her just in her bedroom trying to record a video. And she just doesn't like it's one of the most authentic scenes I've ever seen of someone just stumbling around trying to figure out what her like who she is, what her persona is, what she wants to film, like how she wants to present herself to the world in a generation that grew up basically having to do that, whether it was through YouTube or Instagram or Facebook or, you know, whatever it's everyone is feels like they have to be performing all the time. And I just think it was such a beautiful film to kind of capture what it's like trying to grow up and figure out who you are um, in that kind of world where you're being constantly asked to put on for people and constantly you have to be a brand or you have to be doing something um, and you have to show people that you're constantly whatever it is you're going through basically, but still make it glamorous and still make it appealing. And um, I just think this movie does that so well. Um, so I'm going to vote for eighth grade. Um, I love, I, I, I really enjoy eighth grade, but I, I think, yeah, marriage story, uh, oh, sorry, before midnight. <laughs> Oops. Inception. Uh, um, <laughs> before midnight, I think you nailed it, Marisol, when you said it's, it's one of those movies that shows you love is work. Love is hard work. It's not what the movies show where it's, you know, these two people who just, it's not these, you know, two people who have a whirlwind romance and then everything's all happy for the rest of their lives. It's hard work. They, you have to work at it and it's not easy. And I think that we get this 90 minute snapshot into these, a a 90 minute snapshot every nine years into these two people's lives and how different and how um and just and how difficult life is and i i really love that about before midnight and i think look i'm coming at it from a 31 year old who is got like i'm experiencing these movies as that and uh, you know i understand what with Bo Burnham in eighth grade, like I, what that movie showing, and this is really, really close, but I, I'm going to go with Before Midnight. I just, it's a a really, I love that this trilogy so much and, and how it encapsulates love and how it encapsulates relationships and the human experience. Adam? Yeah, no, I agree with what you're saying. And I honestly think, Bar none, these are two of the strongest uh, movies uh, in this whole bracket that you put together, sir. Um, <laughs> say that with all due respect, uh, um, sir. Buttface, no. Uh, <laughs> keep it mature, uh, just like these movies. Um, eighth grade was such a surprise because I heard buzz about it before I even knew it was directed by Bo Burnham, and I was like, okay, I, I, I. I, I I'm interested. And then I can't remember if I found it. I, I, I want to say like, I saw that Bo Burnham directed when I saw the movie. I think it was kind of like a surprise when I saw the movie. Mm-hmm. And I remember it made me after, after I saw this movie, uh, I remember it made me like reevaluate the comedy of his I'd seen because I always liked his comedy, but I kind of took it at face value, to be honest with you. I'd only seen like two of his specials up until then. And then I went back and rewatched some of his stuff and also, so by the time Inside came out, that's just, people can call it a comedy special all they want. That's a movie, you know, like that's an experimental comedic film uh, and it really flows like a movie. It's edited like a movie. Um, uh, and I think it makes, it, it actually pairs well with eighth grade in a lot of ways, um, uh, you know, in terms of the way it deals with the toxicity of online culture, which, you know, we we all take the good things about, interacting online for granted and that's why we keep doing it and 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 there is value to you know all of that but the the flip side of it is this this undue pressure uh to participate in it even if you have no idea what your voice is yet and you see you see her trying to find her voice throughout this movie uh both online and social groups the way she retreats is so well directed and acted um when she's around other people uh, her nonverbal acting in this is excellent. 
Um, and I, I'm sure we're going to continue to see Elsie Fisher do good work. I feel like I, I feel like she's definitely done some some good acting since eighth grade. But I think um, you know maybe she's having trouble finding the right projects. Like the recent Texas Chainsaw movie, not the greatest movie. I liked it more than others. She was good in it, but I'm just saying. Like I think she's I think she is above that uh, particular movie. Yeah, so, she reminds me a lot of Abigail Breslin. I think she yeah, could be I like another, another. I can see that. Really swinging and just ride the momentum. Um, I want to give a shout out to Josh Hamilton though, because I really like him in this movie. It's a kind of a, a smaller role, but it's so important, and he and he gives a very subtle performance. It's he doesn't give a bunch of speeches about this is how you're gonna go, you know, make me proud, kid. You know, it's just he's just there for his daughter. They don't over oversell the 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 um, deceased mother. Mm-hmm. Um, she is she is passed, right? She's not. She didn't leave. Yeah. That. I mean, oh, she, she, wait, she did leave them? No, he says that she left. I'm pretty, I think, if, if I don't remember. Okay, right. I mean, it's, that doesn't really matter. I mean, I mean, I guess it would for her, but my point right. is it's all about the relationship between him and his daughter, and they keep the focus on that, which I really, really like. Um, and then with Before Midnight, what you have is not only the culmination of three movies, but the strength of Before Midnight, in my opinion, is you could watch that movie by itself and it would stand on its own. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it'll make you want to go back and watch the first two, but I don't think it hinges on having to have seen them. I think it functions really well as a funny, occasionally funny drama. I think I think the dramatic acting in Before Midnight is excellent. Um, I think I really like Boyhood, and we'll get into that on, on another episode, I'm sure. But what, what I like about the Before movies is they're the first Boyhood, really. Like, you know, because you have these characters who are the same in all three movies. And... And by the time we see them in Before Midnight, they're so lived in. Um, you know, they finally established a life together where in the previous films they were still kind of, you know, flirting. And and you see them so settled into this relationship. And I think whether you've been married and divorced, if you've only been in a couple relationships, you're just getting married for the first time. I think there's so much to relate to in this movie. And um, I, I think it does cover similar things to Marriage Story. But what I like about this movie is it, it shows you what it's like to, in the moment, feel like you're walking up to the brink in an argument and, and feel like you're really upset with each other. But then, you know, in that moment, you also realize what you what keeps you there in the first place. And the, the movie does such a good job of demonstrating that. And um, uh, I, I think these are both really excellent. And um, I would like to talk about both of them ad nauseum uh, much more. But, well, you can't, because Jacob put them against each other, and you got to pick one. So one of them you don't get to talk about ever again. I picked Thanks, John, Jacob. I picked John Wick Chapter Three Parabellum. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna bring it back from the dead. We get a resuscitation card, right? Uh, um, eighth grade is so so well made, and I really am ready for Bo Burnham to direct more narrative features. Even though I love Inside, I'm I'm excited to see. I would hope he gets to he does more. The world's his oyster. He can do whatever he wants, but I. I, I selfishly want to see him do more work like eighth grade. Not the same. Like, I, I think he's going to continue to challenge himself. Um, but yeah, before midnight. There you go. Oh, uh-huh. this is karmically hilarious. Uh oh. I've no. never seen before midnight. I'm voting for eighth grade. Oh, shit. Ah! Well, with that. Jacob sleeping on the couch yep. and before bye midnight bye. and before midnight does make it through. Oh, I gotta say, if after all that emotional, like that's probably like, why uh, I wanted to go last because digging my soul out. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't like someone actually having to choose and making it a hard decision for them. Um, <laughs> no, legitimately. No, I got uh, Mara. Your movie is up. Oh, fantastic! The World's End versus Insidious. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you made it sound like I was gonna die or something. Okay. I thought you would. I thought you anyway, whatever. This is um, no, this is super tough. I love both these movies. Okay, save me for last. Okay. <laughs> Am I starting? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick Insidious. That is my movie, yes. Um, I think Insidious is one of the best modern horror movies ever made. Uh like post post Blair Witch, like, which is what I kind of consider the modern era. Um, I think it's, it's absolutely one of the best. It, 
I, I really wish I knew. I've never seen an, an interview about it that's specifically really gotten into the nitty gritty about it. So please, someone like in the chat or if anyone here knows, the setups that they did, the really open-ended setups in the first film that were fully and completely paid off in a way that didn't feel shoehorned in the second film. I really want to know if they had those ideas in the first place and they were just really, they were limited and they said, let's just let's just make this weird creepy and we don't have to explain it because it's a horror movie. You don't always have to explain why there's a weird noise, why you open a door and nothing's there. Like you don't have to explain that ever. But they think in the back of their mind, yeah, but there could be this weird guy with a top hat doing this, this or that, or, oh, it could be him in the further banging around and shit. Like, I just want to know how forward thinking they were because I do think it pairs spectacularly well with its sequel, which seldom do horror movies do. Um, I like the family in it. I like their story. I don't find their children fucking annoying. And I actually care about Dalton. I normally don't really care about the kids ever or most children. Um, <laughs> but like they didn't do so many of the easy horror movie things to do. And I do think that they started to create an interesting lore. I like the idea of like there hadn't really been too much done in the astral projection part of horror, at least not recently. Hi. Oh, hello. He's hitting me in the, in the butt. Say um, hi to Dan for us. Your cat <laughs> loves butt stuff, Mara. Uh, that's my cat. Uh, but I also think like the red faced demon, super iconic. Uh, you know, there's a few things that are a little hokey at the end, but uh, at the same time, I love the world. And I, Dan actually, that is his favorite of the Cornetto trilogy. Um, he thinks it is, or I'm sorry, no, he thinks it is the best of the trilogy. Shauna Devet is his favorite still. But um, I, I really, really love it. But if I, I've revisited Insidious dozens of times, that is not an exaggeration. I, Hot Fuzz is my favorite and Shaun of the Dead is my next favorite by like a very small gradient. The World's End is real far down there for me. And I'm not saying that makes it bad. I just mean compared to the other two, the quality factor is diminishing returns for me because I just don't invest myself as much in the way those characters connected to one another. So I, and, and also, by the way, I got to say, Pat, Patrick Wilson and Rose Byrne and Insidious, what a, like, it's, it's actually a couple I want to succeed. So, yeah, I'm going to go with Insidious. It won't make it, but I don't care. <laughs> um, no, it won't make it, but I don't care, though. Like, World's End's legit. I, I'm going to, um, so, okay, I'm going to vote for World's End because it is my favorite Cornetto movie. It's, it's the, it's the one that I keep revisiting. I really love this movie so much as mm -hmm. from, um, in the Cornetto trilogy. And I am not a massive Edgar Wright person. I never have been. I'm all, I'm the Edgar Wright hater. And, for, but I just really love this movie. I, I think World's End is such a clever and fun, unique take on, uh, a world invasion film and that's just yeah I, i'm gonna go with uh, the world's end uh, marisol yeah okay interesting matchup yeah it's it's always i like hearing i just loved there just hearing like the different takes on the cornetto trilogy because like i yeah i i haven't heard I haven't heard a lot of people say that the World's End is their favorite. Um, I guess I'm in the more generic camp where World's End is is my least favorite of it between Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz. Hot Fuzz for life. That is a that is a whoop 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 whoop. Um, just had to. Now you make. I wish they would do a movie, a sequel to Hot Fuzz that makes fun of the Bad Boys sequels now. <laughs> Like, like, in, even more. Like, I mean, it kind of did. It did, I, it did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes, 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 yes. Um, yes, hot fuzzier. I get it. Um, <sighs> but yes. Uh, but um, uh, World End is still, it's still, it's still a great mashup. It is a, it is a solid mashup. I do find the alien invasion a little, a little underwhelming. I, I don't feel, I don't feel it's, it's, oh gosh, I don't have enough interesting stuff to say that oh. um i enjoy world's end i love the dynamic of all of them i love martin freeman patty constantine i love everybody i love all the friends in this i love everybody the banter between everybody going back and forth eddie marson is he in there too? yeah he's one of the friends right yeah 
I can't remember. Yeah. Um, I love everybody. I wanted to punch Simon. I wanted to put Simon Pegg's head in the toilet the whole movie. That's the point. I like the the friends dealing with I like the maturity of friends dealing with with having to come to grips with themselves years later and having a friend who can't let childhood go and you know being, you know, who's stuck in the past. I think we I think many people have friends like that. And that felt good. The alien innovation stuff was secondary to me. It was a little underwhelming. Um, which was a strength and a weakness for this. I do love the strength of the the relationships is one of the go-tos. I think Rossman Pike is is wasted in the movie. And that's a real shame. I do think that eh, just wasted, but I know it was about the, the boys, and their relationship. Insidious, I don't have a ton of fond memories of Insidious. Um, I do appreciate that it is, I, th I think one of the reasons it was a real hit, because it did feel like a throwback to I feel it felt like throwback horror, and I think that I felt that in its design. I felt that Insidious could easily have kind of been made in the seventies. It kind of has that kind of energy to it. Um, fantastic closing scene, strong opening, fantastic bone chilling closing. Um, but man, that climax looks like the cheapest haunted house shit in the world. I'm so sorry. It really, really does, and. And I only saw Insidious once. I'm sorry, Mara. <laughs> Don't hurt me. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna pick World's End. No, you're, you're fine. Know. By the way, it was totally worth it. Check this thing nice. out. We got there. <laughs> oh. Wait, what did you make? Oh, I made an acai bowl with um, strawberries, banana, chia seeds, oat bran, and honey. Yum. Yum. At first, I you thought it was hungry. Chex Mix, and I got, I got. Oh. I did. I thought it was scrambled eggs and Chex Mix from this angle. So I was just <laughs> like, "What? What we got going on there?" But what you describe sounds infinitely better. Uh, Adam, you're up. Um, yeah, with World's End, uh, really, um, I enjoy this movie. Um, uh, and I agree with what you're saying about the alien invasion stuff. By introducing that it made me kind of wish the whole movie from the outset had been a, a concern, a concerted effort to have fun with the alien invasion genre, the way the first two movies do. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of tacked on yeah. and it doesn't ruin the movie, but it kind of makes me wish that it had been a bigger part of it. Cause I, I there's such right. film fans and I would have loved to have seen them play with that more than they do. I yeah. do. I do like everything about the ensemble of friends. That's the most relatable part of the movie. Um, I appreciate the sim simple approach of just having them do a pub crawl. And I know, I don't know, uh, if Mara, if you it can hear me, I have you ever seen um, David Bruckner's The Ritual? Or is that, I mean, you've watched it with me. Has anyone seen the horror movie The Ritual? No. Nope. Okay, well, when Mara comes back, we'll double check. But um, that movie is... Um, yes. Okay. Um, so when I saw the ritual, I thought of the world's end, uh, because it reminded me of, you know, these, these college friends getting back together. It's a similar setup, very different movies, um, very different endings, but, um, uh, go through the ritual. It's on Netflix. It's a really tight, like good horror movie, in my opinion, really, Gila. Uh, you will not expect where it goes. No, you but, but, um, that's what I like about both movies is you feel these friendships do have a history. You feel history between these actors because they have chemistry. And that's why I stay invested in the world's end and laugh at it as much as I do mm -hmm. with insidious. That was such a fun surprise when it came out um, because the title was so evocative and James Wan had done dead silence, but that like, that was his only like supernatural thing up until that point until insidious, I think. So I was really excited to see him because I dead silence is no classic, but it's got some cool, cool stuff in it and some some really cool imagery and puppets and whatnot it's, so i was really fun. it is fun it's better than the boy <laughs> no one was asking but there you go um uh That's but brahms the boy to you <laughs> the boy, brahms the boy too the best title yes, ever yeah. um so um, back to Insidious, what I really, really like about it is it is a remake of Poltergeist, like kind of shamelessly so, but it owns that and it does a new thing with that premise. Poltergeist invented a subgenre of movies. A lot of classics do that. Mm -hmm. And the remake of Poltergeist is boring. It's not incompetent, but it's boring because it's just very literal and, it, and nothing, nothing happens in it that's interesting. 
It's not the worst thing I've ever seen. It's just boring. Insidious reinvented that premise. And, and you finally get to see the whole thing that freaked me out about Poltergeist is I, I couldn't see where Carol Ann was. I couldn't see where she was. I like, just freaked me out that she was stuck in the TV. I didn't know what that meant. And I like the idea in I, Insidious, you run across that barrier and, and yeah, it might look goofy to some audiences. I can appreciate that. Uh, but I kind of like the, um, uh, the set design of that alternate world, because I feel like it's kind of a reflection of these childlike mentalities that are projected onto that, you know, that other world. And also let's talk about Lynn Shea for a second. Cause I love her. And, Aww. um, I, I, I love that they just kept bringing her back for these movies and figuring out ways to do it. Prequels, ghosts, who cares? But she's great in this original one because she's Lynn Shea. And she drives so much of it. Reminds me of Zelda Rubenstein from Poltergeist, who's also just amazing. And she like carries a torch for that kind of character so well. Um, I love the Darth Maul ghost. I love the bride <laughs> ghost who gets her roses in the sequel, which is, like Mara said, so much fun. And the most recent Insidious, I know we're not talking about the whole series here, but the most recent Insidious, not amazing, but I like it better than three and four. And I like that it gives us a coda to what happened with this family, because I really care about this family after the first two movies. And um, I think it's I think it's worth seeing where they go. So I vote for Insidious. I really like Insidious. I watch I've watched it a, a lot of times and I've watched all the sequels at least more than once, even though three and four aren't my favorite. So. There you go. Tell. Do I have to go? Yeah. <laughs> you got the deciding vote. Bro, why? I haven't seen The World's End. <laughs> <laughs> but I also don't like Insidious. <laughs> yeah, I know. You <laughs> <laughs> cool. That's a tough spot to be in. Vote for the yeah. one that you would want to watch more. If that's The World's End, vote for The World's End. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we would rather rewatch. That's a good point. You rather rewatch that yeah. for the first time rather than, or watch that for the first time rather than rewatch Insidious. Um. Hmm. This is a tough spot to be in, my friends. I know. I do feel for you. Um. Okay. So I guess what I'm gonna have to do here, just because it's just kind of all I've got to go off of, like. Typically, if I have to pick if I'm going to like rewatch a horror movie or watch a horror movie or I'm going <laughs> to pick to watch an Edgar Wright movie, I'm going to pick the Edgar <laughs> Wright movie. So that is what I'm going to have to do because right. like I, I got nothing. You guys put me in this position, so I don't know. <laughs> so that's all I got. All right. Well, with that, the world's end moves on to with the that next- insidious tiptoes into the tulips. You get absolutely. Yeah. Right. yeah. Good. All right. Answer. We are halfway through. Woo! Halfway. All right. Eight to go. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Next up, (laughs) Rocket Man versus Daybreakers. (laughs) Okay. Um, Oh. I love Daybreakers. I do too. Like, I just straight up love Daybreakers. It's a lot of fun. It's terrible. I do not care. It's not terrible. Okay. Okay. (laughs) All right. It's you not have terrible. the invisible like, peaking whiskey. I'm I'm sorry. It's it's fun. I really enjoy it in like the campy fun kind of way. Rocket Man's I, I like Rocket Man. I, I prefer Rocket Man. <laughs> like, I, I'm, Damn, I'm, da- how dare you say that you like Rocket Man, Jacob? <laughs> um I'm I'm voting for Rocket Man. Uh for Taryn's performance alone. Like like Real. you know, yeah. and it's not even like yeah, so I, I'm I'm going Rocket Man. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor. Yeah, this one's a fun one because I really like Daybreakers. I think that it's really um it's really tough to do a vampire movie now, especially because it feels like kind of every angle has already been done. And it's like, it's really tough because people are going to be pretty brutal about like, you have to make a great vampire movie. Otherwise you're just going to get like memed to death and thrown off the, thrown off the balcony. Like you yeah. got to really lock in. And even though dig breakers, isn't like a perfect, like filmmaking masterpiece. I think it's so fun. The angle that they take with the vampire lore in the movie, I think that Ethan Hawke, Sam Neill, and Willem Dafoe are having so much fun. Like, it's it's really a great time. And, again, like, 
they just are at least trying to do some like a twist on the vampire lore that we see a lot of the time. And it's really cool because it's this little like Australian production, like Australian crew that made the film, which is really cool to see like back before we really had Australia pumping out like movies like this yeah. um, or even like higher tier kind of movies, I guess you could say. So this is really cool um, for those reasons. Rocket Man is like, I guess it's like one of my Roman empires <laughs> where it's like you, you go, man, I love that movie. And also I'm forever just going to be trying to mathematically compute how Bohemian Rhapsody got all of the love and Rocket Man got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like that's forever going to be the thing that I just sit here and go, why do we live in an unjust society that decided that that was not going to get any of the recognition because Taron Edgerton does a great job um he makes the songs his own which I think is really cool because no one's going to be Elton John no one's going to sing exactly like Elton John and I think a strength of the movie is taking his vocal abilities and his vocal range and doing the arrangements in a way that works for him um, and really elevates the film. I think it's super fun that it is actually taking the musical approach. You do have like these big dance numbers and these big production scenes, and they're really leaning into the fantastical element of it instead of it just being like a kind of concert movie, which you can do and you can do that well. But I do think it's really fun that they tried to do something a little different with it and have it be, um, like I said, more fantastical in a way that I'm sure Elton John really appreciated because he is such a unique um, artist and I I just really I loved it I had so much fun with it as someone who really loves Elton John really loves his music um, it was it was one of those movies where I was like ready to get my heart broken because biopics are dangerous musicals are dangerous musical biopics <laughs> are like mm -hmm. I could go really bad really quickly um, but yeah I thought Jamie Bell was great in it um, I really, I really thought the cast was really solid. Richard Madden was having so much fun. Like he, he was, he had great chemistry with Taryn, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't really want to send the little quirky, fun vampire movie packing. <laughs> but Rocket Man's so good. <laughs> ah, this one is like stupidly actually hard for me because i just I didn't expect that why <laughs> i i know you love daybreakers but you love rocket Man. i know but it's one of those things where it's like where adam has said several times there's like one of these is just gonna die in the first round and we're never gonna talk about it again in the bracket and that <laughs> makes me sad because i think daybreakers is a lot of fun um yeah okay i guess i'm voting for rocket man <sighs> sorry for bullying you into that apparently God. um <laughs> adam uh yeah rocket man i agree with what taylor said um on the heels of bohemian rhapsody this movie is just uh such a such a step up from that and i say that because uh, dexter fletcher did <laughs> essentially like finish bohemian rhapsody right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so like it was nice to see him get to do it from the ground up his way and you can see how different that was. Also, you know, the participation of Elton John, um, you know, like you had the involvement of Queen to an extent, but I mean, that's not Freddie Mercury. And um, and the movie just is so superficial. Um, Bohemian Rhapsody, in my opinion. Rocket Man, I like it because it gets all the style right. It gets the spirit of Elton John right. Um, I'm convinced Taron Edgerton got this role because of how good he was in the animated movie Sing as that gorilla. Um, he sings uh, uh, Still Standing and crushes it in that movie. And then I saw him get cast as Elton John a couple years later. I'm like, it makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> and, um, and he's so good. Like, uh, should have been nominated. Um, uh, and yeah, like, I, I really, really like Rocket Man. Um, um, I haven't revisited it a bunch, to be honest with you, not because I'm mad at the movie. It's just, you know, it hasn't cropped up um, as much as I enjoy Elton John's music. Um, I almost kind of want there to be a Rocket Man sequel. I really want to see I want to see like a dramatization of like older Elton John because mm -hmm. he's been so active in mm -hmm. in in all his life. I kind of want to see like some of I want to see Taron Edgerton come back in 20 years and play him again. I, mm -hmm. I, would, I would love that. Um 
And with Daybreakers, another one I caught up recently on because of the show. And I had heard things over the years. I remember when it came out, I wrote it off. I was like, no, no I don't need Underworld 1.5 or whatever this crap is. I don't care. I don't want to see it. And um, shame on me because I'm a fan of this genre. I'm a fan of vampire movies. And I finally caught up with this. And um, it's it's so it's fun because it's so inspired, in my opinion. It feels so inspired by Near Dark. And it takes like the ideas of Near Dark and makes them more literal. It makes it takes like the whole idea of like vampires be, like having to travel during the day and and uh, figure out ways around it that are practical um, is really, really that that hooks me really quick into vampire stories. And I love the way they set up this society because it's such a good premise. What if the majority of the world is vampires and less than five percent are humans? They're fucked. And I love that, like, that's so apparent from the outset of this movie. And then you have all of these heavy hitters in the cast. Mm. Ethan Hawke, uh, like you said, Sam Neill is so good just monologuing as, like, you know, the bad guy in a suit. But he's a, he's a vampire bad guy in a suit, so it's cool. And then, um, and then Willem Dafoe just shows up with, with a southern accent because he can. <laughs> and um, I just... The energy... They sustain it throughout the whole movie. Um, I'm very fond of 30 Days of Night. You might recall how hard I went on that in the IG bracket, and it didn't go very yeah. far. Thanks again for that, Jacob. <laughs> um, but Daybreakers remind me of all the things I love about 30 Days of Night. It's it's gratuitously violent, but in a fun way. Heads getting ripped off, you know. And then and then it 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 plays with something that doesn't get explored enough in vampire stories. What if you can cure vampirism? What would that look like? How would it work? How would how would that affect the the physicality and the psychology of someone who was a vampire? And and then and then what if you get the whole world to be vampires? Are they going to want a cure? It, it it deals with all these concepts in really fun, creative ways. It doesn't think more of itself than it is, but it's also confident in what it is. And I honestly think Daybreakers is the perfect like kind of thing that could be adapted into a television series because it's so thought thought out. And I can't believe these are the guys who did Jigsaw, Saw 8, I think, right? Yeah. The Spirit Brothers, that is not a great movie. No, um, no. But I also don't think they had their hands on it as much as they did with this. And um, Rocket Man, I think, is arguably the stronger movie. I think it's, it's going to stand the test of time. But I'm going to vote for Daybreakers with Gusto because I was impressed and I am going to rewatch it and they should, they should do a spinoff show or a sequel at some point. Cause the world is so cool that they set up. So there you go. Marissa. Another, another great, exciting <laughs> deduction here. I didn't catch up with Daybreakers, but um, I am going to say this, everything about it just sounds so interesting. I'm always, I keep, keep getting intrigued by this premise i think I, the reason i never caught up with it in theaters and then haven't still caught up but i think i think i was burnt out you know mm -hmm. underworld movies um I, I, I just, like height of twilight vampirism like yeah I, I yeah understand. i think i think it just got buried in a small movie i look, look it doesn't matter i missed it um i wasn't able to catch up with it uh rocket man Rockman specifically, I was gonna vote for it. I I think I genuinely would still vote for it anyway, even if I had seen Daybreakers. Yeah. I just have like kind of a hunch. I still would vote for Rocket Man anyway, but I also really like Rocket Man. Like it's a really, really, really fun creative, especially in like the route conventional sea of biopics, musical biopics, even too on top of it. Rocket Man was a breath of fresh air, especially when you compare it to the fallout after Bohemian Rhapsody and, and the connection with that mm -hmm. there. It was almost like the anti-Bohemian Rhapsody, a movie about a gay rock icon that actually gets to express his gay love in the movie. Like, hello, like, just like a, just the most basic thing why Rocket Man is, is superior. Just one of the things, <laughs> just one of the many reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, Rocket Man reminds me a lot of a movie I love from the 2000s, which is Across the Universe, which is a very, very, it's very visionary like that. It, it takes a lot. I think it follows a lot of inspiration by that, like just visualizing what if there was a, you blended reality and, and the real world and, and your songs were an expression of your lives. And I love the way that's visualized in Rocket Man. I think it's a very splashy, beautiful, big swing, emotional movie. 
that Taron Edgerton gives his heart in that movie. I love how he always tried to like break out of just being the pretty boy from the pretty, the pretty snarky guy from the Kingsman movies and really tried to take on interesting roles. All the flowers for him. I would, I think I would pick Rocket Man anyway. Mara? Sorry. No, no, no. I'll keep it short. Um, I would vote for Rocket Man. I think that Rocket Man is the um the La La Land marriage story of the right person, wrong time, as far as uh, Oscars go. I think if this had come out before Bohemian Rhapsody, I think that it might have even stood a chance, depending on what it was up against. It could have actually stood a real chance in the Best Picture race, um, considering we all know why Bohemian Rhapsody didn't. Cough, cough, don't need to say it. Um, <laughs> but, like, I just, I find it to be the far superior film. Um, not that that's what we're really needing to talk about, but Daybreakers, super fun. What a great ride. Pardon me. But like Rocket Man, it has so much earnestness. It has so much fun. It's so well made. I like a good jukebox musical. And then when you add that to the biopic, like it was just such a good, smart way to go because you didn't have to shoehorn music into this movie. You could put music wherever the fuck you want and you could add a dance number wherever the fuck you want. You could make an elaborate you know, fantastical space sequence, whatever, wherever you want. Like it was just such an intelligent way to look and celebrate the life of such a colorful person. And also it's hard when the person is still alive because <laughs> they didn't shy away from some of his flaws and vices and darker characteristics. And, you know, that could be hard because sometimes you're like, no, can you just like maybe not do that and just only show like the cool parts of me? So I like that it did feel as real and true to him as a person as you could kind of imagine it being considering, you know, you never really know that person because it is still a fictionalized version of a person's history. But yeah, no, just really, really love it. Enjoy it. I've, I've revisited it far more than I've revisited Bohemian Rhapsody, which is never so <laughs> fair um all right well with that rocket man does move on next up ready or not first disobedience mara's gonna yeah no mara's just like wow yeah. yikes thanks you're welcome Ready? damn you are uh, that's this, this matchup yeah Sorry. So, uh, Mara, you want to talk, talk about disobedience? <sighs> this is this is very tough. Mm. Especially again, I'm not mad at either of these movies. I know which way this is going to go, though. Um, okay, I think Ready or Not again. Let's just celebrate horror movies again, guys. Like, and comedy horror again. What a great little uh, genre blend here. Um, Samara Weaving, I had no freaking clue who she was really. And, uh, I just, I love her in this movie. I've rewatched it many times. Uh, it's always nice to see Kittredge back in the mix. Uh, cause I hadn't really seen him in anything between like OG Mission Impossible and that. And then obviously now he's back again, but neither here nor there. Um, I think it's really smartly written. I love at the end where there's the, the timing and the pacing of the reveal is so flawless because you question everything. Just su such a well-made film. Uh, the right amount of gore also, because it has just enough to make me go, Ooh, but <laughs> you know, not so much that I think someone who's very sensitive to like extreme violence, blood, viscera, sinew, you know, those sorts of human body <laughs> things that they couldn't watch it. <laughs> um yeah it, it also is like a, a really great birth control psa it's just it's a really <laughs> good movie um but disobedience i hope that maybe some viewer actually took the time to go watch it because it's a really good movie um what a niche probably one of the most niche movies ever made where it's like okay we're going to talk about a same-sex relationship inside of the Orthodox Jewish community. <laughs> like, 
all right, let's just needle haystack this. But no, <laughs> the performances, Rachel and Rachel are just fabulous in this. Um, you can really feel the sincerity of their connection. They also have amazing chemistry. I mean, they're both absolutely gorgeous specimens of humanity. So, I mean, I don't find that to be incredibly hard. But, um, uh, and also Alessandro Nivola uh, of Jurassic Park 3 fame. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, he Yo, really is a supporting character and an actor that, hey, don't eat your Ooh. own hair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I brush them and I have to like pull the hair out of the brush and then they try to eat it. Anyways, I'm sorry. <laughs> but as a supporting character from an actor that like people might be like, oh, I feel like I've seen that guy in something before. Um, he really kills it because if if he can't make it if he can't confront uh, SD the way that he does, then the movie doesn't work. And I don't know. I just, I think that it is such a great story set in a place with people that I know and that I understand. And it's just, it's so, it's so singular, not just because of like what it's composed of, but because the movie itself is, it's so sincere. It's one of the most sincere human stories and character studies that I've ever seen. And yeah, I just, I really cherish that this movie even exists. So I'm going to vote for it because I really sincerely am just giving it the I love it vote. I'm I'm going with my heart in this case. The, uh, Marisol. Oh, oh. oh. Um, this is so wild how these movies could not be more different. Like, so it's another situation, like, where do we begin? <laughs> One is so sensitive and thoughtful and deep and a character study and involvement of really fleshing out a bleak and somber fleshing out of fully dimensional people. And the other is a completely thrilling, sensory, schlocky, surface, surface, delicious, horror comedy thrill fest um <laughs> let's let's start here let's say this okay let's start here um so i did i actually just caught up with disobedience this week i haven't seen it so thanks for mar for really pushing it for be on the bracket um and this is a movie that you can have a conversation about for hours days it is so niche and it's such a wonderful wonderful character drama um and uh, Jeremy Miller makes a funny point. Um, yeah, imagine this is the movie where Rachel McAdams knows what's happening in her relationship and makes a choice about who she wants to love in her life. And so it could be, it's a polar opposite of about time. I'm just gonna say that. Sorry, Jacob. Um, <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know. He wrote about time. I um, know, right. Um, but, but very fascinating. Uh, Rachel McAdams is the heart and soul, I think, of this. It's a movie with great three um, performances, main three performances, but McAdams, the way, again, the way that they make these characters very three-dimensional really does suck you in and you are invested in this drama. Very bleak, very desaturated. This is, when it starts, I'm like, oh, oh this is going to be depressing as shit. And it is in a lot of ways, but it also is very life-affirming in a lot of other ways and special to see a lot about, learn a lot about relationships in life from a completely unexpected place and perspective you never we've never seen in a movie before never would have thought of and disobedience gets so much credit for that um mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 uh, but i fucking love ready or not so <laughs> much i uh is this goofy that i go with like the, I, you know look look <sighs> I love Ready or Not. It is one of the, the, it flies by. I have rewatched this movie a bunch. Um, it, it, it plays and subverts just gently all the horror final girl tropes, haunted house tropes, like, like revenge girl tropes that you had ever seen in all these movies has just enough fun with it without being too cute, too meta, taking itself too seriously. Samara Weaving is disarmingly charming and punkish, and you are always on her side this whole movie, just star-making lead performance. And it is so deliciously fun. Like you said, Mara, just a perfect amount, punctuations of gore throughout the movie, 
fucking dynamite ending. Love the ending of this movie. And I have this big shit eating grin every single time I watch Ready or Not. I can't deny just the highs and the extreme feelings that I get, even though I love everything that I thought and mold over and all the conversations we had about disobedience. And I think there's a lot to, I think it's just as important kind of cinema. It's either just two polar opposites of why movies are important because they extend, extend your understanding of the human condition and make you really think and make you make actors really dive into these roles. But then also on the other end is just like the pure visceral thrills of it all and the thrill of of a big emotion movie making. I sorry, I have to pick ready or not. <laughs> Adam. Already. Okay. <laughs> um yeah, I, I think ready or not's pretty spectacular. Um, you know, um such a debut uh, from those directors. And I also uh again you know, I, I talked a lot about, um, you know, how I, one thing I liked about why I went to bat for Daybreakers, even though I do agree Rocket Man is probably objectively better, is because I just liked how thought out it was. I thought, I like that, I, I know they sat up for hours thinking about this vampire world. And I feel that with Ready or Not in terms of all the thing, all the places it goes, and, and we're all being cagey about the ending for the handful of people who haven't seen it, don't want to ruin it, because it's so cool. Go see it if you haven't seen it. Um, and but by the time we get there, that's that's all set up in ways so it has so much rewatchability. So when you go back and watch it, it's one of those great uh, horror movies and horror comedies as well. It's a horror movie first, though. It's not, it doesn't lean into the slapstick. That's secondary, and it all comes from the characters. It's not hey, let's set up a joke. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's all situational. And um, I like that everything. Uh, plays even better when you rewatch the movie. Um, it's a great ensemble. Um, love all the actors in it. Um, um, I think like this is the first time I've ever loved Annie McDowell in a movie. I'm just gonna say that. Put <laughs> <laughs> on Annie McDowell. I this is the first movie I've ever liked oh, Annie McDowell. I'm just well, gonna say that. I thought Continue. you liked it because she. Uh, anyway, but, no. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, Ready or Not, such a blast. Um, uh, once I and sorry if no one else noticed this and I now you're not gonna be able to unsee it if you if you uh, haven't but uh, it, it at least parts of this are the Billy Madison house uh, so like the stairwell the, the big winding stairwell and then the the courtyard with the the pool and everything that's all the Billy Madison house so that's the that house is used a lot in movies which is kind of cool um, so I like that um, and then with disobedience yeah another recent watch uh, uh, like like you said we we this one was something we dug into like after the fact a lot, cause it has a lot of staying power. And um, I think this movie was done such a disservice at the time in terms of the way it was marketed. First of all, I'll, I'll do respect to the poster. I think the poster is incredibly reductive. Um, it, you know, it's the two actresses kissing and, and I feel like that's meant to lure in the lowest common denominator and the movie so much more than that. Um, and, um, it's so much more complicated than that. Like, like Mara and Maricel have been saying, um, I love the way, uh, the, the film immerses you right out of the gate in, uh, you know, the Jewish faith, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're at temple, you're, you know, you're in a synagogue, you know, uh, and, and that is such a great way to set up the movie. Um, uh, uh, and it didn't, it didn't hurt that it was Anton Lesser from Game of Thrones. I love that actor. Um, he's so good in this, but, um, uh, yeah, like the whole movie, like explores the complexity of relationships and, and what you, what you settle for, um, due to outside circumstances or imposing circumstances. And, um, I told Marisol after I saw it, this movie made me think a lot about past lives and, and the things I liked about that movie. And I think there's, there's a lot of um, similar themes, but this explores it from a different angle. And the thing that I liked about this is unlike in past lives, the husband has a history with both of these characters. And so he is not someone you just like, like it's not someone to write off or anything. You know, he's, he's, he's in the thick of it with everybody. Um, and all three of them have such interesting arcs and they all grow throughout this story. Um, uh, the score is really good. The score surprised me uh, because it's very haunting and, and horror adjacent and certain, and, and I, I guess anachronistic is more of the word. Cause like, it just has some 
some very interesting uh, pieces throughout the score. Um, so like Marisol was saying, I think these both represent different sides of, of filmmaking really, really well. Um, and it's with, with reluctance, I have to dismiss either one, but I, I, I do have to vote for ready or not. Cause I, I genuinely love it. I've, I've watched it probably at least like five or six times since it's come out. And I, but I will revisit disobedience. It's a heavy hitter and I'm going to be recommending it to a lot of people because it was completely overlooked and it should have gotten a lot of recognition at the time and it just didn't. Um, so yeah, see disobedience here if you haven't seen it, cause it's really good. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to go, I, I still need to see disobedience as it's, it, it, I just missed this week. It's the one I missed this week and, um, ran out of time. So I, I am going to go with ready or not because I do absolutely love that movie, but yeah, I, I, I do really need to see disobedience. So. Yeah, um, Ready or Not was another one that we went into blind when we saw it. We didn't really know anything about it. Um, so it was a really awesome theater experience yeah. to have, not knowing what the yeah. hell was going on. Yeah. Um, it was amazing. Like we, I remember we walked out of that screening being like, what just happened? Like, what did we just see? Um, Samara Weaving was absolutely magnetic in that movie. She is just in charge of everything going every second she's on screen you're, you're drawn to what she's got going on um i think the whole cast is great i think that because everyone's so dialed in and buys into the story and the characters it really works because it would have been really easy to get this slightly wrong and have the comedy and everything fall flat and have it just kind of be like ridiculous instead of being ridiculous and fun and also terrifying at the same time like it strikes a really great balance of all of those things has one of the most memorable scenes that i will never forget when she slaps her hand onto yeah. the onto the nail or the screw or whatever mm. it is yeah we'll mm. never forget that moment ever because that was just you it was, it was perfectly set up you saw it coming and then it <laughs> happens and you just read it yeah you read it and it was so perfectly executed i i love ready or not yeah Mm -hmm. all right well with that ready or not does move on oh, to the next i'm round. scared of this next one. Oh, Adam, please don't kill me <laughs> whiplash versus john wick <sighs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. adam oh. i had a pair of drumsticks you don't want to know what i do to you man <laughs> or if John Wick had a pair of drumsticks, rather. <laughs> Jacob, uh, that's mean. That's <laughs> mean. I would feel targeted if I were you right now, baby. That's fucked up. That's fucked I up. I genuinely that's thought funny. Parabellum was going to make it out of the, the wild card. Oh, I shut up. Really you mean. <laughs> that's a loaded <laughs> horse shit. <laughs> All right. Okay. So... <laughs> Whiplash, uh, speaking of Damien Chazelle, um, uh, you know, like, you both, both of his, two of his in this? That's, I didn't actually put. Oh, yeah. Uncle Randomizer it. did it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Rando did it. That's right. That's your scapegoat. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Whiplash is truly excellent. I mean, like, I think. I have not met anyone who's seen Whiplash who's like, well, phew, they phoned that one in. Like, it's like, it's not <laughs> a thing. The longest time. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, okay. We'll, we'll get to you. Oh, <laughs> you, are, you are a piece of work, Blunden. You really are. Um, so, I... I uh, yeah. Like, this movie um, works on, on, on every level. Um, um, I, I, I just really appreciate the dynamic... Um, of the characters. Um, I appreciate the, the way it addresses the concept of obsession um, and, and, and what it means to really get into that headspace where to the point where you might literally get yourself killed, you want to be good at something and um, pushing it to that brink. And I find myself resenting both of these characters throughout, which is why I, fi I find it so interesting and compelling to watch. Um, I am not the world's greatest drummer, but I am one. So I connected with it on that level too. Um, you know, my, my, my drum instructor was much more forgiving growing up. Thank you, Jim Swanson. You're, you're great. Um, 
but like yeah i really related to him as the pupil even though i never took it to that level um and uh just yeah like um I, I have not i have nothing but good things to say about whiplash you really did a number on me with the wild card thing <laughs> And, and like, I'm glad we got to talk about John Wick two and three. Um, but I think it's too soon to be talking about him again. I was hoping to have a little more time uh, before returning this. So with John Wick, like I said about drive earlier, when this came out, it was such a, such a exciting word of mouth hit because mm-hmm. Keanu had kind of been staying busy since the matrix, but hadn't had a, a hit, you mm-hmm. know, and I was always rooting for him. And then when John Wick came out, and I heard how simple the premise was that he was just the world's best assassin. And I, I, I just, I, I love the, the name John Wick. I don't, I don't know. Like there's just something about it. And then when you finally see the movie and I've seen the world's best assassin set up countless times and only in John Wick, does it really pay off in a, in, in a spectacular way. They do put us through a traumatic opening act, but it sets up the movie. So as we've discussed in years hence, he has complete license to murder the planet, essentially, <laughs> um, because of what they did to his dog and his car. Planet's got to go. And his car, yes. to be clear. <laughs> yes. um, but even when he recovers his car in the second one, it immediately gets like obliterated again. So, uh, but um, yeah, what this movie understands is Chad Stahelski understands Keanu as an action star. You know, he understands that very well. And and he takes the the visuals of action so seriously and makes it clear and concise. And the gunplay in this, I'm I'm not a fan of arbitrary gun violence. I don't I, I don't get a thrill out of seeing guns go off in movies for just because. I it needs to be motivated by the story. There needs to be a, a reason to it. And when it's <laughs> when it when it happens to this scale. Um, and his body count is like triple of Jason Voorhees at this point, and that's substantial. He like, like I I know it wears you out in the sequels. We've talked about that, and I think that's valid. But I think what most people can agree on is this first one. I think strikes just the right balance where most people can get through this movie without feeling like they're covered in blood, and they're still on John's side. Um, I think this movie's pretty much perfect as an action film. I'd say the one thing that kind of underwhelms me is like you know, his confrontation with like the, the, the main villain, if you will, at the end. Cause I'm like, that guy is not gonna be able to throw down with John. I, I never have bought that. I never have, but it doesn't, it doesn't ruin the movie. Um, um, I'm like, he's just been mowing through people this whole movie and Gramps is like throwing down right. with him now. Like, I don't believe it. Yeah. Um, or not. yeah. So this is really tough. Um, I think these are two films at the height of their, their genres. And um, I think they're, very very different but you you put a gun to my head i'm always gonna yeah yeah of course it's john wick i have to pick john wick but i'm also gonna call him after this and i'm gonna have a word with him (laughs) adam if you and i go down swinging we're gonna go swinging together um i'm picking john wick and it's it's close it's not as close as other people would think. Um, I've always been the whiplash quote unquote hater. I think it is a very good movie. I do not think it's the freaking modern classic that everyone else instantly did. I've always been the, it's extremely good. I love JK Simmons performance. I think he is fantastic. I just don't connect with the movie as well as, a lot of as as everyone else the first john wick however holy shit that movie is a fucking incredible um i think the 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 setup is just so perfect and it's kind of also the reason why it i think you don't get over uh, old or kind of it doesn't start to belabor is because you're still mad about the goddamn puppy like <laughs> through the entire movie you're just sitting there going nope Every little thing, everything they do is 100% deserved. I don't care. <laughs> like, they, like, this little, and I think cast, I, I think casting, um, Greyjoy was perfect. I, he's just, he is just such a, like, oh, you're a shit. shit. Um, and I, yeah, I just, 
I love John Wick, the first movie, so much. I think it's so perfect. I, I and I think it can just so perfectly be summed up by that the O. Like it was so uh why did you hit my son? Well, he stole he killed he he stole the car of John Wick and killed his puppy. Oh. Like just like uh-huh. that that yeah, there. Do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're fucked. I like I just love that about it. And yeah, so I'm going John Wick. Uh Taylor. Yeah, this one uh sucks. <laughs> <laughs> really bad um i love the john wick movies i think the first john wick is amazing i think um everything you've said like it has the perfect setup to get the audience on his side um it's the perfect role for keanu reeves it brought about the keanu songs that we've all been waiting for um so i love that love that love that but damien chazelle is my favorite director he has zero misses for me like he i just love everything that he does i love his style um i love the way he writes his characters i just i just really connect with him when it comes to these stories as someone who is deeply impacted by stories about um you know what again we've talked about it with lala land like what you have to sacrifice for your art and how far you're willing to go to do it and the toll that it can take on you if you're giving all of yourself and everything you have to give and then more even than you really have to give. Um, and I think whiplash is a great um, encapsulation of that kind of story of two characters who pu- are pushing themselves and end up pushing each other basically to the brink and then further and then further. Um, mm-hmm. And what these kind of destructive tendencies can do to you if you let your passions get to that point, if you let it become that, um, what, you know, obsession look can look like, um, if if it gets to that point. Um, I absolutely love that JK Simmons, um, got his love for this movie that he ended up walking away with an Oscar completely deserved. Um, I think the way that it's directed just with, you know, really centering around, actually getting to watch like drums being played and actually getting to be like up close and personal with the music and how it moves through the movie and how it's basically its own character um, as it is in a lot of Chazelle's movies. Um, I just think it's brilliant. I remember watching it for the first time and being like, Oh my God, I cannot wait to see what this guy does next. What, what we're going to get from Damien Chazelle next. Um, and like I said, he just continued to impress me. But I think this introduction to him as a director is just one of the best. Um, so I will go down alone <laughs> swinging for Whiplash if that's what it is. But that's fine. Mara. Uh, you won't be alone. I'm also going to be voting for Whiplash. Um, I I really love the first John Wick. Uh, this is not the basis for my choice. Uh, it's not my favorite of the John Wicks. John Wick Chapter 2 is. But um, I I have recently rewatched Whiplash um, a couple times, actually. And I was very, very late to the party. Like, I think I only watched it for the first time this last year. If not, it was 2022 for sure. And uh, as a musician, that movie gave me such... Like, I almost wish I could pull up my Apple Health to show you, like, what my heart rate and my blood pressure and everything was when I was watching it because it was it was so palpable. And I do think that a lot of people overlook that Miles Teller is also just delivering. Like, yes, J.K. Simmons, he earned that Oscar, but if Miles Teller hadn't been delivering as well, then he wouldn't have had anything to work off of. Uh, I, I find so much joy in the dynamic that they create and the subtlety of the rivalry and of the petty revenge and just the idea of like what is the price of excellence and how do you decide what choices you're going to make in your life how important is like family versus you know your individual goals and some of that i think they should have gotten into more but i also love it from the standpoint of music Um, I love that there's so much music in the movie. Uh, It's just, it's such a great watch. And another small contributing factor is I literally cannot watch the puppy die 
even though I know you don't see it, but like, I cannot watch it. Can't, can't, can't. The very first time I watched that movie, even though I knew what happened, we had to stop for like 40 solid minutes until I could compose myself. Uh, so I have not revisited the first John Wick in its entirety since because I cannot. Mm. So Whiplash, I thoroughly enjoy over and over again. And uh, yeah, I'm going to choose Whiplash. And Marissa, deciding vote. <laughs> Nurse Ratchet, Darth Vader, Annie Wilkes from Misery, J.K. Simmons and Whiplash. We're talking about like the greatest movie villains of all time. Come on. I'm sorry. We're talking about one of the, the goats. John okay. Wick could take him. <laughs> like, I would love. I would love to see Unless J.K. He's teaching him how to... in his little tight ass little black shirt fight John Wick in his little suit. J.K. was, look, did, you, did anybody know how ripped J.K. Simmons was until Whiplash? Like, it's just, he's just a physical villain. He's mm -hmm. all the villain. He's one of the greatest cinema villains already. He's on that list. Look, this is lightning in a bottle whiplash. I is one of the best. I'm sorry. I John Wick is my favorite John Wick movie. That's I think I think everything that you guys are saying, the power everything, Taylor in particular, the, the power and the simplicity of the first one. Like, like that's the strength of the first John Wick. You know, and it launches iconic action filmography, action franchise. We love Keanu. I'm not going to take anything away from John Wick and what this first movie accomplished. But, yo, I, I look, look, Whiplash, this is, you feel the blood, the sweat, the tempo, the music. I feel this movie. This movie, you feel it. You feel it. You feel, <laughs> feel it. Yeah. Like, this is just one of the most killer just mind-blowing astounding directorial debuts okay of of the century like what are we doing i i'm i'm just all the hyperbole for whiplash it is one of my favorite films ever um and and it's such a testament to miles teller like i'm happy you brought up miles teller yeah mara that like just like you know, you don't even like him, but damn, like, <laughs> like, like he's a little shit too. You're like, you, you're just, you're a punk. You're not even good to your girlfriend. And like, like, look at what this is doing to you. What do you want to, you want to achieve all this greatness, but at what cost? Like, you know, like you, you, and that's really difficult to do and still make that character compelling. And as much as you can, you still are in his corner so much because J.K. Simmons is, is just the baddest baddie in like the history of baddies. All right. If with that, broadly about Whiplash, I, I love it. With that, Whiplash does move on, and sadly, we say goodbye to John Wick. Sorry, Jacob. I worry about your safety. <laughs> I did not see that coming. If I'm being honest, I did not see that coming. Well, that's why I said I was going down swinging alone. Um. So <laughs> this, so this next one, Marisol, uh, I'm going to start with you. Uh, don't. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Black Swan versus Inside Lewin Davis. You're starting with her? Well, it's, yeah. the, her it's the movie she picked. So I think she's gone. So I don't think you're going to be able <laughs> All to right. start with um, her. I will, I will start then. Um, the reason, and it's actually really interesting that these two are in the same freaking bracket, but they didn't have a matchup together. Um, the reason Whiplash has never really quite landed for me is because because everyone it's the movie about obsession it's the movie about obsession this is the movie about obsession it's black swan um black swan as a movie about obsession is works for me on so many levels i love black swan a lot i like i really really love it i think natalie portman is fantastic i think her performance is absolutely phenomenal i think the way that the movie tells essentially its own version of a uh, swan lake is really ingenious and really clever and i think it's Darren aronofsky's best directed work i there is so much i love about this 
I watched Inside Lewin Davis today for the first time. And I keep debating if I'm going to pick it. I really do. I really, I was really not expecting loved, that. really I was not expecting loved that. Inside Lewin Davis. I was not expecting how much I would um, because I figured I'm picking Black Swan. It was going to take Yeah, before off. we started but, Inside Lewin Davis, because I love Inside Lewin Davis, before we started, he's like, man, this movie could be really good, but I, it, there's no way that anything would be like getting me to pick against Black Swan. <laughs> so I'm really, really... So, to, like, so why, did, why did you like Inside Lewin Davis? I, like, really, I love, love I, Oscar Isaac's performance in this. I think it's phenomenal. I, I, I think it's the uh, I and I actually think these two are really interesting matchup together as like different sides of the artist's life, and I I think um I I I think Lewin Davis as a character is majorly flawed, majorly flawed character who is you 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 don't ever really. I I think you you follow the film and you're you aren't rooting for him. you are kind of rooting for him but you aren't you're rooting really because Oscar Isaac's performance is so freaking good. <sighs> <laughs> you know I I am I am gonna do it. Yeah I I'm gonna go inside Lewin Davis. Really? I I I just. Yeah, I am. I'm gonna go into Blue and Davis. I really, I really fell in love with that movie. So <laughs> I'm back on Marisol's good side from the looks. Of She's intrigued. <laughs> All right. Yep. Floor is yours. Me? Yeah. It's you. You picked this movie. I like. So it's the floor is yours. Okay. Um. <laughs> I appreciate you, Jacob. I never thought I would ever say that. <laughs> I, like look, Enjoy while it lasts. Look, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, you surprised me, Mister. We Bunny. do have a nice palate cleanser next. I will say that. <laughs> okay. Um, this is yeah. This is a crazy, crazy matchup. I I agree with so much of what you're saying. Black Swan is incendiary. It is. It's. It's a perfect. Aronofsky made, he killed it. He blew it out of the ballpark. I think it's a perfect sister movie to The Wrestler. I think they're both movies about obsession. And he made two back-to-back films about obsession, about perfecting your craft and art. And one is is seen as this incredibly low art, is wrestling, but it takes the same obsession as this high art, which is ballet. And I love... They're similarly themed movies with these extremely different approaches. Like one is stripped and and gritty and realistic, and the other is so heightened and expressionistic and and just just a a living fucking nightmare. And this is one of absolutely his strongest movies in a fascinating career. Just Black Swan is just so I love this movie. It is one of my favorite ways. It's one of my favorite examples of how you use, how you use fully, fully 300, 360, use the language of film to tell a story from script to visualization, to performance, to like, like themes, just, it is like the full way you use this medium to tell every aspect and pull every feeling out of how you tell a story. Whew. Man, Inside Lewin Davis is possibly the most perfect Coen Brothers movie ever made besides Fargo. It is, it's perfect. I, I think it's literally perfect. I, this is so, this is the toughest matchup. I think this is tougher than Before Midnight in Eighth Grade for me because this is also a masterful film. I think this is, one of the crown jewels in the whole Coen Brothers filmography, which is an insane thing to say when you think about it. Um, and I think it's this, it's this perfect tragic odyssey about a soul lost in time. It's 
it's a statement on folk music in the 60s, sure, in, in a broad sense, but it's also just a statement about the push and pull and the tragedy and hopefulness of all about our soul human endeavors and the human condition. And, and Oscar Isaac's character is like this avatar for all of that. I love how symbolic everything is in this movie. I mean, it's a Coen Brothers movie, so there's you see these kind of elements a lot, but it's symbolic of so much. I love the symbolism of this cat, that cat, man, that cat. That cat was an MVP in this movie. <clears throat> I love how this movie pairs really, really well with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? It has a kind of feeling of, it feels like Homer. It just, it just feels like an odyssey in plain sight in the world without any fantastical elements, but there seems like there's something magical happening in this movie at the same time. I love that frequency in it. I I don't even mind the color grading in it. I think it is to the point and to a purpose, um, the filter on this movie, and it all, it all might be a dream. It all is a dream, but it all is the rise and fall of your life and how ugly it is, and you might be a person who nobody, you just might be another person lost in time and nobody even knows your name, but it doesn't make it any more epic and harrowing your journey, what you go through. I think Inside Lewin Davis is next level, and I think it's perfect. I hate choosing between these movies. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But you gave me a little hope, Jacob. You know, I appreciate you, Jacob. I was not expecting you to say Inside Lewin Davis, and I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to pick it over the next one. Uh, well, it's funny because I just sung the praises of a movie about music, but uh, I was also a dancer. So uh, a lot of people have already people have discussed themes and execution, and I won't belabor the point since we've been here for some time, but I'm actually going to vote for Black Swan. Okay. Yeah, this one's tough. Um, this is one of the tougher ones just because it is these movies, I think, you know, as everyone's touched on, are like the very height of um, exploring, you know, what it means to be an artist, what it means to pursue that kind of calling that you feel in your life. And they're both so done so differently. Um, and I think that Black Swan is Natalie Portman at her best. I think she's incredible. I think it's such a such a high art way to explore high art, if that makes sense. Like ballet is held to such a high standard. Um, and just the psychological way that the movie goes about um, exploring what obsession in that world can look like at its most heightened form, I think is brilliant. Um, Inside Lewin Davis is my favorite Coen Brothers movie. Um, they're very hit or miss for me. But this movie and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou are my two favorites. Um, I don't know if anyone's noticed a theme, but I like music a lot, <laughs> um, which is why I like Dave and Giselle a lot. Um, and those movies really connect with me a lot. Um, those aspiring musicians, those aspiring artists who um, music just like hits their soul and they just feel called to it. Um, and that's just something that I always really connect to and really appreciate. And I think... Um, Oscar Isaac is incredible in this movie. I think he's just so, he's so tuned in. You, you completely believe that he's living this journey. Um, and I just love the music in it. I think that, um, Carrie Mulligan is great in it. I think it's really cool to have a movie where she got to work with her husband, Marcus Mumford on some of the music for the film. Like that's really cool. Um, I think please Mr. Kennedy <laughs> is hilarious. I love that scene. Just having Adam Driver st sitting there just saying outer space and making weird noises while they're trying to do a song. Awesome. So fun. Um, I just I just think it's great. Um, I think it very cleverly utilizes Justin Timberlake just the right amount, like where it's like, oh, we'll put him in there, but we're not gonna like over put him in there where it has the opportunity to like kind of fall flat on its on its face like i think it utilizes him in the perfect way which is great um the cat has been mentioned mvp of the movie like your reaction to the cat was the best thing like I, it's so it's such a great character in the film i love that it carries through the whole entire thing um so yeah i i am gonna also vote for inside lewin davis adam um yeah inside lewin davis i saw uh 
uh, quite a few years after it came out recently past couple years not as like uh like i think two years ago and so glad when i finally caught up with it um i was raised on music from uh folk music from the 50s and 60s a, a lot um and uh just really immersed in that culture and so watching this that that all played to the nines for me i love that stuff love the music loved the historical backdrop of it and i also liked having this character who's you know just basically a you know an amalgamation or an avatar for someone you know trying to break out at the time and and really really uh like the the you know the nomadic nature of it um that's really cool it reminded me of the um the hal ashby movie bound for glory uh which was for, nominated for best picture the year rocky came out and that's why no one cares about it but it well i mean the and all those other movies that I came mean, out that yeah 76 was it's, 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 not, it's also 1976 all president's men network yeah it's not taxi so driver no one cares yeah. about it that's but bound, murderers row but bound for glory is a biopic about woody guthrie and it's a very similar um uh setup uh, uh but what in terms of like you know you see him interact with all these other historical figures of the time and um I like what what Inside Lewin Davis does is it gives you all of that, but it never loses um, the sense of perspective with Oscar Isaac's character. And um, I really feel for him when he's just trying to make a quick buck off his music, but isn't thinking about the long game. That's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Um, it's heartbreaking. So yeah, it just everything about this movie works for me. And Black Swan, I think, is a, one of the stronger Aronofsky films for sure um uh natalie portman is good in it uh, well she's great in it but um i was i remember being really impressed with mila kunis at the time because you know after she blew up again after forgetting sarah marshall and she knew she had this like second chance at like getting back into like mainstream films because i don't i'll never forget she did american psycho too you know i maybe i may be one of the only ones as a bad yeah, you film need to let that go as yeah. a bad movie <laughs> It is. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> and it's not really an American Psycho movie. That's not important. She uh, is really good in it, shows her dramatic chops. Um, and I don't hold this against the movie because I think this is a, it's not exclusive to Black Swan or other films that preceded it. It did make me think of Mulholland Drive a little bit and not because of superficial things, but, but in terms of the way the personalities blend together as well. And then um, Ingmar Bergman's film Persona is like kind of the original version of all of these movies. Um, and that is not derivative in my opinion. It's inspirational. That's a good thing. But I, mm -hmm. when I watched Inside Lewin Davis, I saw something that was really confident and, and mature with its perspective. And um, I, I give Black Swan all the accolades, but I will vote for Inside Lewin Davis. I connect to it personally, and I just think it's really strong. All right. Well, with that, at all I had no idea. <laughs> on. That's all crazy. right. Real quick. Sorry. Imagine if, like, I never even thought about this. I don't know why I never thought about this. Now, imagine if they had cast Kira Knightley in Mila Kunis's role in Black Swan. <laughs> that would have been, been hilarious. The biggest mind fuck of all time. Yeah. Like, all right. She already watched Mila Kunis. Four left. <laughs> all right. Left. Four left. Let's do this it. one is Here, like is the palate. I think this is the palate cleanser. I don't think this will be hard, but I could be wrong because I've been wrong all night. Train wreck versus game night. Hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna go first. Yeah, all right. That's, game that's night. Next. <laughs> that's fair. Um, as I think the one, as someone who actually does really enjoy train wreck, I really love the romantic comedy aspect of it. Um, but it's a Judd Apatow movie, so it's of course nearly half an hour too long. And I, there's just a lot about it that just doesn't work for me but there is so i i really love the chemistry between i i love bill hader really in this movie i think bill hader is like mvp of the film and really elevates it and and helps make it a better movie than it is game night however holy crap that is one of the funniest comedies we've had in the last decade and um i love it so freaking much and their chemistry is and off, Rachel off McAdams has some of the best one-liners in this movie too. Iconic Absolutely stuff. Absolutely does. So I, yeah, it's it's game night. Uh, Marisol. Oh, okay. Um, I might be alone, maybe over here. I, you know, I know, I know, everybody really, really loves game night. I, 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 I won't, I won't belabor it. I, game night. I do look forward to watching it again. I really enjoy a bunch of jokes and lands in game night, but, but I, 
I, I look, I'm 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 just gonna pick train wreck here. Guys, yeah, sorry. I I, <laughs> I I do like the Apatow brand, the more introspective comedy. I like the I like Amy Schumer having her chance to really bring her brand of comedy out there before like everybody hated her. I don't know. I don't know. I think uh, you know, I think people are really, really never mind. I, I won't get into my opinion about Amy Schumer, but I don't know if that's on us or if it's them. I think it's them. There. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I think we, we lost oh. you guys for a bit there. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, what about now? Yes, yeah, we're good. Okay. In real time? Okay. okay. Let me test right now. No, no, we started losing you again. Yeah. Um, Mara, I'm going to go to you and then we'll, we'll go back to, to we'll Adam back. and Mara. Here, we'll go out and come in. Yeah. That's what she said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, uh, for me, train wreck, uh, when I saw it, I laughed during it. But when you go back, if you actually look with any amount of like critical, logical thought about how relationships oh my gosh hi jay what do you hear <laughs> <laughs> sorry you can look at her little face <laughs> sorry sometimes when cats are actually like acting like cats instead of like people i'm like oh my god look at you anyways sorry um but if you actually take the time to like look at her as a character again not as a person because amy schumer the person not amy schumer's character they are two different people um that character is inconsistently portrayed and a terrible person. Like if that were a male character, we would boycott the film entirely. And I think that that like is kind of sexist and like Bill Hader is the only thing that keeps that movie held together for me. Like it has a few funny jokes, but it, it and Tilda Swinton also, Oh my God. I do admit, yeah, I just totally adore funny. her in the movie but like i've i've actually rewatched it fairly recently and when you look at it like without any rose colored glasses for the the comedy in it it is really not so good um and i'm not saying game night is like a perfect comedy i do think that it might honestly at times be trying to do like the cramming like six laughs a minute thing from time to time when i don't think that it should but I think that it is incredibly fun. I think it's pretty smart. Uh, I, I like the cast. Oh my gosh. Um, Billy Magnuson. That's, that's the blonde yeah. guy, right? Yeah. That was, I think my first exposure to him. Cause this came out before um, Ingrid goes West, right? Uh, it came out after. No, oh, after, okay. 2015. Yeah. Yeah. It came out what? after, but it was, right. but well, it had to be 2016 or later. Because I know I saw yeah, it with Dan. Yeah, 2016. Right? Ingrid goes six. It's either 16 or 17. Yeah, but thought, yeah. Game Night's definitely later. Okay. Yes. Either way, though, like seeing him in movies, that was very early exposure for me. And oh my gosh, I just love when someone is really good at playing an idiot because, you know, it's just, it, it works for me. It works for me a lot. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to vote for Game Night. Adam? Um, I, 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 agree with Mary soul sticking up for train wreck in in terms of like i i liked it more than i expected i don't go back to it a lot um i think judd apatow has been winding down for a while as a director um i haven't seen anything he's directed in a long time that i thought was like just that had me in stitches um but i appreciated you know some of the thoughts you know behind the movie um i agree mara she is you know complicated to say the least um uh and a little little frustrating i was frustrated with her character mm -hmm. but i i did i i do enjoy amy schumer as a comedian and as a comedic performer i think the movie i feel pretty is a pretty bad script but i laughed at the movie because of her performance in it more than i thought i would I, i'm not going to watch it again probably but i'm just i want to give amy schumer some credit um and then with game night I don't go back to this movie a lot, like a lot of folks do, um, um, but I can appreciate why it has such um, um, a fan base because 
we hadn't had an ensemble caper comedy in such a long time. And, um, and to have it be an R rated one is really fun because it's a mad, 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 mad world is an all time classic. And you don't have to do a three hour epic comedy to, to match that energy. You can, um, uh, like what's up doc is like a shorter version of, of that kind of like energy, like a caper comedy. And I think that's what game night does well. Um, and I think it's anchored by Jason Bateman and Rachel McAdams, uh, who, um, are just great together. And the supporting performances are fun as well. So I will vote for game night in this particular situation, but I'm calling BS on you uh, for the umpteenth time tonight, Jacob, because how did two of the same genre go up in the opening round together like this? It's nonsense. It's nonsense. Look, Jacob voted for John Wick. Like he gets a temporary, you know, <laughs> he, he threw you a little bone That was an there. empty gesture. He threw you a baby bone he put it up against yeah. Whiplash. He was an empty gesture. All right. Uh, yeah, this... This might hurt. I, I know, I know, I know. Game, game night laws. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to hear me talk about it. All right, know. next up. Anyway, up, upgrade versus How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> Mara, why did you pick me? I don't know. I just picked <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this is a, a little bit more difficult than I think it should be. At least for me, I really like Upgrade. Um, I, I think that at the time. When I walked into Venom, I was like, man, Upgrade is going to be the best Venom movie this year. Like, and with discount Tom Hardy as well. Like, this is, yep. is going to be so lame. But Venom is neither here nor there. Not not germane to this conversation. But um, I really like uh, what it has to say. I, I like the physical action in it so, so much. Uh, I'm such a sucker for it. Um, but man... How to Train Your Dragon is just so classic, like that music and, of course, what it has to say about physical disabilities and Night Fury and the, it's basically Kitty Cat and the big <laughs> eyes. and it's, it's all the things that we've been here a while, so I won't say any more because I'm really hoping it'll make it through. We can talk more later, but I'm going to vote for How to Train Your Dragon. <laughs> the, the, the single smartest thing I think the filmmakers did it in at all for this movie was make toothless look like a cat because what? that open like i'm not gonna lie just that first scene and like you know yeah it's cute but it works so well for filmmaking of just you know the whole build up for a night fury and then it's just this cat like creature and it's mm -hmm. adorable and cute and really funny and but also fierce like oh my god this thing's terrifying when it wants to be like i i how to train dragon i mean my cats are nine pound little uh <laughs> like death traps so yeah, yeah i ha, look how to train dragon is one of my all-time favorite animated films i i love this movie so freaking much um i really like upgrade like i really like upgrade this is not i it's just an unfortunate first round matchup for it this is uh, this isn't a contest. I'm going How to Train Your Dragon. Um, Adam? Yeah, How to Train Your Dragon. I remember... Um, uh, it is it based... It's based off a book, correct? Yes. Okay, so I wasn't oh, familiar... I, with the, I wasn't familiar with the source material at the time. And I remember when they announced this movie, I'm like, DreamWorks, come on. <laughs> like, get your act together. What is this title? <laughs> I'm like, like, what kind of piece of garbage are they going to churn out now and um and like an asshole i skipped it in theaters <laughs> and then like a year later after everyone told me like no it's good i watched it i was like yeah yeah this is good and the reason it's good is because like it takes its time setting up everything um and uh the humor is not forced like it isn't a lot of dreamworks movies um it you know it's it's an extension of of all the personalities in it and even even the characters who lean into the comedic relief aren't grating, which is so refreshing in an animated film. The score, oh my goodness, is it oh, John that's... Powell. Yeah, I, I think it's John Powell. I, yeah, I, it, yeah, it's John a Powell. really really excellent score. All three of them are scored beautifully. Um, and um, yeah, like I I love that Jay Baruchel of all people is <laughs> is the voice of this. 
He's the, he's the one voice uh, that, that doesn't sound like everyone else in this society um, of Irish Vikings, apparently, <laughs> um, or Scottish Vikings, either or. Um, but uh, yeah, this movie really works, and um, it's it, it 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 took me by surprise. Upgrade, so cool, um, and just so exciting for Lee Winnell to to Insidious Chapter Three is not you know not the best, but he made the most of it. And he's like, this is my directorial debut. It is what it is. And then to follow that up with upgrade is just astonishing. And uh, like Mara was saying, the action in this is unlike stuff I've seen in other action movies, which I love. I love that uh, Logan Marshall green looks scared every time he's fighting somebody. Like he doesn't know what's happening to his body. That's a really hard thing to do when you're doing fight choreography. So um all the props to upgrade and honestly based on genre alone you know like under a lot of other circumstances upgrade would probably get my vote but how to train your dragon gets it by a little bit because it's a movie that subverted my expectations it won me over i i love uh animated movies in general but um outside of my time with my daughter sometimes i have to make an effort to watch them admittedly so i was a little curmudgeonly about it and it won me over so i vote for it massive yeah um upgrade uh caught up with that this week i wish i had had when it when it came out very fun great small scale uh sci-fi that makes amazing use of its tiny budget this is really fucking impressive the way upgrade looks i don't know how they did it with the budget they had mm -hmm. um i really don't um great tight small scale what if sci-fi and familiar dabblings that we know, AI goes evil, what, what are you gonna do? And I think it takes it a few unexpected places. I was not expecting the humor in this movie at all. I wasn't expecting the unique way that action is filmed, humans are fighting almost robotically in this. Um, there were a lot of great surprises and upgrade that I really wasn't expecting. And it has the uh, ending that I did not see coming at all that really shook me. Um, How to Train Your Dragon. Um, the second one is my favorite one. And I really applaud DreamWorks for really actually breaking away from their stupid, grating, tiresome, just regurgitating top 40 hits on their soundtrack, just needle dropping, lame, easy pop culture jokes. How to Turn Your Dragon is DreamWorks actually branching out and trying to rival Disney in some sense by creating beautiful, fully realized, not wink, wink, not pop culture reference kind of story to enthrall audiences of all ages. I just feel the first one is pretty beat by beat for me. Toothless is adorable, but I find Hiccup's arc um, frustratingly conventional. I I, I, could, I, I, I do really want to rewatch this movie because I do still agree and I really like that it exists and I love that it got us a second one, which the second one takes the first one and just soars with it, pardon the pun. Um, so I do really want to rewatch How to Train Your Dragon. I totally agree with what you guys are all saying. I probably will like it even more when I rewatch it. But right now, today, I am going to pick Upgrade because yeah. I really don't. Yeah, I think everyone's pretty much summed it up. Um, I loved Upgrade. Didn't know what to expect the first time I watched it and it took me completely by surprise. Um, I think it's incredible what they pulled off with what they were working with. Um, but yeah, I, How to Train Your Dragon, the, the score of that movie of all of the movies is just incredible um toothless is like everything to me um so uh, yeah i'm gonna vote for how to train your dragon all right. all right next up the farewell versus hugo <laughs> you seem happy maris <laughs> i'm cool i'm cool I'm, let's, okay, see. Well, let's, see right. let's see what happens i'm cool okay. i'm cool I'm cool. I'm cool. <laughs> uh, Taylor, I'm going to yeah. start with you. Um, so I haven't seen Hugo. The Farewell, however, is awesome. Um, I really wish that the version of Aquafina that we get in The Farewell it was what we get from her most of the time instead of what we get in The Little Mermaid and uh, Kung Fu Panda and pretty much everything else she does. Um, I think she's really great in this movie. Um I think it's a really beautiful story about family um, and about culture. Um, and it's kind of what we touched on with Crazy Rich Asians, having the cultural differences between 
Chinese and Chinese American um, and American perspectives and Western perspectives um, and how they deal with family and how they deal with illness. Um, and it's just a really beautifully done film about that and how you reckon with that. Um, and, and just, um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it. Cause I just think that if you haven't seen it, you should take the time to watch it. Cause it is just a beautiful film. Um, and I think just with what I know about Hugo, I would probably still vote this way anyway. Um, but just as a disclaimer, I have not actually watched Hugo. Mara? Uh, I agree with everything Taylor said about the farewell. Uh, I think it's just such a charming family movie. Uh, Nine Eye is so amazing. And I just, I don't know. I, I agree with everything about Aquafina. I was very skeptical about seeing her in a drama. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess it'll just be funny then. It'll be a funny drama. But no, it's it's just it's so sincere. And I really wish that she would just act now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> like it'd be great. Um, but yeah, I, I won't belabor the point. He goes fine. Uh, but I, I think the farewell is very, very underrated. Adam. Yeah, Hugo, Hugo achieves what it sets out to do. It's a great love letter to the era it's set in. Um, Scorsese is a film fanatic himself, and that movie represents that in a very earnest way. And I'm glad I've seen Hugo because I think everyone should see it at least once, especially if they appreciate the work of Scorsese. Um, um, he, he gets to go back to a time and play with it in a fantastical way, and that's really cool. Um, it's, it's definitely, um, of a piece with cinema Paradiso, if you haven't seen that film. So, uh, it's, it feels very, it feels like it draws inspiration from that, but the farewell is a movie that, um, was, um, underrepresented in terms of recognition, recognition when it came out. Um, like everyone's saying Aquafina is an actor first. Um, uh, she's making her bread and butter on, on comedy and her voice, um, and yeah, make that money, but also come back to us at some point and do something again like The Farewell because it's good from beginning to end. Um, it's genuine, it's sweet, and uh, it it's enlightening too, um, um, you know, in a lot of ways. So I, I will vote for The Farewell as well, please, and thank you. All right, Marisol. All right. We're gonna talk about this movie a lot more, so I'm not gonna not gonna skip through it. Thanks, Marty, for making a kids film. It's adorable. I know you love movies. You shared all your love about movies. Hugo is adorable. We all think it's cute. A little Ace of Butter Butterfield. So you should open up a conversation yeah. when you finally meet him. It was yeah. cute. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, for saying, no, it was cute. Look, we all we all appreciate Hugo. We all think it's cute. Lulu Wang was operating on another frequency with the farewell. I just it's just it's just nobody's gonna like this, but it was my favorite film over Parasite the year it came out. I think I think oh. I, you know nobody's gonna like that opinion, but but I would watch the Farewell over Parasite. But I do love Parasite. Um, but Farewell, yep, everything you guys said. Aquafina showed up. She was like, she's here to say, Farewell is is delicate, devastating, patient, beautiful. Feels like a peaceful slice of life, and it makes it destroys me and. It reminds us all to just love our grandmothers and you cannot have enough of movies reminding you how just important connecting with your family is and and in spite of of weird situations going on farewell let's we're going to talk about this movie some more let's do it let's go farewell i love you all right and Glad this farewell know, makes man. it through all right last one zero dark 30. First. Oh. <laughs> This is the Jacob sleeps on the couch one. And Definitely. I will go last. Yeah. Um, I watched Okja finally. I really liked it. I think it's a very, very good movie. I really did. I, I actually really did. I really thought it was a great movie. And I thought, uh, I think what Jake Gyllenhaal is doing in that movie is ridiculously insane that's just jake gyllenhaal yeah. that's just like him showing hey, up i oh, zero dark 30 i think zero dark 30 is one of the penultimate like one of the just 
most important films from the two thousand from the twenty tens. I think this is a huge accomplishment of a film. I think what Jess, I think Jessica Chastain is incredible. Um, I love Jennifer Lawrence in Silver Linings Playbook, but Chastain was robbed of her Oscar for that movie. She is phenomenal in Zero Dark Thirty. I think I understand the criticisms around torture and its portrayal of it and the way that it portrays torture and how, and I understand that. I just think that the way it tells its story is, and the way Catherine Bigelow directs this film really resonates with me in, in a way that, um, in a way that a lot of her other films don't, um, Although I do love Hurt Locker, so I, I'm I am going to go with Zero Dark Thirty just because I I really love that film so much. Mm-hmm. Tell no no oh. <laughs> 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 uh, Adam yeah Okja was one of the other ones I caught up with uh, recently um, and glad I finally saw it um, um, and appreciated a lot of the themes it tackled. Um, think, um, a lot of the humor, a lot of the humor worked. Um, and I, I love Jake Gyllenhaal as much as anybody, um, wasn't thrilled about his performance in this movie, uh, only because I, I, and this is all due respect to Bong Joon-ho. I didn't feel like Bong Joon-ho was directing Jake Gyllenhaal that much in this movie. I feel like he kind of ran away with it. That's okay. His, his character is a supporting character. He doesn't really drive the narrative that much, but he was a little, he clashed a little bit when he showed up for me. And that, 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 that took me out of it a little bit, I'll be honest. And I was excited to see his character because I love him. Um, Tilda Swinton's also interesting in this, um, in both of her roles. Um, so a lot of the heightened humor was, it, it, it worked to an extent, but the movie for me st- struggled to balance its tones a little bit, um, even though it remained earnest the entire time. Um, a movie, uh, that it made me think of that doesn't get talked about a lot is, um, Richard Linklater's fast food nation from the two thousands. That movie is in my opinion, very underrated. And it's a movie that it, 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 it confronts, you know, the meat industry and I'm not a vegetarian and I made my peace with that, but I'm also conscious of, of the reality of, of that industry. And, and, and it, and the, there's so many overhauls that need to be made. And Fast Food Nation was one of the first movies that really took it to task, like with comedy first, but then it 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 wraps up its 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 point by showing you what it looks like inside of an ab- a slaughterhouse. And it's 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 deeply upsetting, especially if you've never seen one before. And and Okja tackling that was impactful, but I felt like there's so much lead up to it with all this these weird um humorous uh like anecdotal uh tangents that it goes on so the tones frustrated me a little bit even though i thought visually it was very striking and i think it has some of the best visual effects we've seen in the past like 10 years because the creature effects in this are pretty seamless Uh, so Mm -hmm. i just want to give it credit for that Mm -hmm. um and then with zero dark 30 i agree with everything jacob said um i think what the strength of this movie is is that it you you feel relief at the end of it but i don't feel rah rah at all i don't feel like like america fuck yeah i don't feel that and i don't want to feel that watching this movie i feel like they accomplished the mission and i feel all the work that went into it and i think that's the 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 strength of the movie and Catherine bigelow focusing on that mm-hmm. instead of it being like let's all do a victory lap at the end that's the key also bonus points for scott atkins showing up even though he doesn't do karate kicks i just <laughs> like the stuff uh, Marisol. Yeah. Okja is, um, what a odd, what a little oddball movie in Bong Joon-ho's filmography. Feels like they're just scenes from like in, removed in different movies, like all kind of put together in Okja. It is, it is a roller coaster. What an ambitious mix of genres. I don't think a hundred percent successful, but I also do really just like, obviously the message with Okja, but I think it, it probably could have gotten it to it, to it. I think faster, maybe. Um, but Okja's, a mostly successful stew of all kinds of genres all over the map performances that is pretty pretty fascinating to watch if not you know perfect um 
And then Zero Dark Thirty is over there is even stronger than the Hurt Locker. I think it, the irony the Hurt Locker was a sweep, was the best picture and best winner, uh, director for her. When Zero Dark Thirty is just haunting. It is. It is talking about we. It is where we patting ourselves on the back, but at for what costs? And it is you feel like you are just watching this happen in real time, or just watching it happen. But you also understand you're watching a dramatization of it happening. It is haunting. It is, it sucks you in without any flair, any dramatics. It just, that is excellent filmmaking. Catherine Bigelow can do this kind of shit in her sleep, it seems like. And Zero Dark Thirty is one of the best films in her entire filmography, I think. It's easily a win over Okja. The Okja's fun. Fun. Fun? Fun's not the right word. Nope, didn't mean to say that. It's a hoot. Uh, but, but randomly really, really fucking goofy oak jaw at some points. It's weird. Like, weird. Like, I'm like, uh. but yeah, no. Zero Dark Thirty. Yeah, I, I agree, Jacob. It's just, it's just, we're, we're on something really, really timely and timeless with this movie. Really important film. Yeah. All right. Well, since it's been eliminated, I'm going to give him Oak Jones vote. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? Or? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I think that um, Tilda Swinton's fun in it. I think Paul Dano's great in it. I think it's just kind of a wacky film with a really heavy kind of message that um, I do think works in most of it. I just, I really like it. I think that it's a um, film that really stands out that a lot of people wouldn't have really made or made that way. Um, and I just think that, I don't know. I think it's, it has a really strong message about, um, you know, animals and the way that we view animals and the way we treat animals. And, um, there are definitely parts of it that are tough to watch, but I think it's a good movie. All right. Well, with that, Zero Dark Thirty does move on, and we have made I it I like how you didn't even allow me to say that oh, I did sorry. vote for Zero Dark Thirty. Sorry. Right. Yeah, because I sorry, yes, I, I I did miss you. Hey, it have a, I always miss someone some at some point in this bracket. Sorry, Mara. That's okay. That's fine. I do I do want to say though, I prefer the Hurt Locker. Anyways. That's fair. All right. I mean, well we'll the Hurt Locker, I get it. Yeah. We we did it. Um we have gotten through round one of bracket one. I'm still somehow alive. Give it a couple hours, maybe, but um, we'll we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, that. real quick, uh, before I forget, did everyone get their uh, their their care packages this week? Yes, we did. did everyone, we did. I we don't did. believe so, unless I just have it. Uh, no, Mara, I got a confirmation yet. of delivery. Unless unless you changed. Hold on. Oh, did you send it to the PO box? No. Oh, okay. Then uh, I just need to check then because I don't okay. normally check my front my front thingy unless I get a camera alert and I didn't see one. All right. But well, maybe let's they were released until sneaky. next episode then. All right. All right. We'll save we'll it until next off. week. We'll hold on. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> All right. no yeah, definitely not a big deal. Trust me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but we we have made it through this week. What are our teases for next Let week? Let me give you some teases for mean? next week. Um. Thank you guys so much for doing for for staying with us while we do this, and uh, I'm gonna give you some teasers because uh, yeah. next week's fun. I do need to actually, sorry, I do need to uh, reiterate. Next week, uh, it's actually not gonna be next week. It's going to be this Friday at yep. 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, as that as uh, unfortunately a few of us can't do next Sunday. So this Friday we are going to be doing the show. At you guys are getting it early, you're getting a treat. Yeah, you are getting a treat. <laughs> uh, and we are going to be joined, of course, by uh Jeffrey Khan. So yes. that is going to be a lot of fun. But I am going to give you some teasers for all. So here are all the films for next week. We have 21 Jump Street. Oh, yep, I need to get rid of that, don't I, Jacob? Might help. Yep. So we have 21 Jump Street, Baby Driver, Black Klansman, Blind Spotting. Blue is the warmest color, Burning, Cold War, Contagion, Django Unchained, Easy A, Free Solo, Green Room, The Hunger Games Catching Fire, The Imitation Game, Little Women, The Hate You Give, The Last Black Man in San Francisco, Les Mis, Les Mis Logan Lucky, Looper, Mandy, Midnight in Paris, Moonrise Kingdom, The Nice Guys, Ocean's 8, Only the Brave, 
Paranorman, Prometheus, Queen and Slim, Shin Godzilla, Shutter Island, and Toy Story 3. And your teasers for next week. What do we got? Hmm. Mm. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, excuse me? Oh my God, why? <laughs> Guys, oh, uh, no. I'm, I'm trying to ask why Jacob no. got the only black people in this bracket fighting each other. That's what are we doing here? What are we doing? Hold on, hold on. Let's All right, all right. All right. No, no. Come no, on. are you serious? No. Yeah, that one hurt. Um, That's going to hurt me specifically, too. I think that your randomizer might have yeah. a problem with black oh, people. I think your randomizer Marisol, might be Marisol, racist. Marisol, remember the message I sent you? Remember how I said, oh, you're going to be so mad at some of these matchups? Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, my, my, my. Yeah. Well, hey, we just figured out that there's been a new uh, advancement in AI. They're racist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could, uh, yeah. I'm feeling some type of way. I think I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, we will see you next week. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> mm.